Good evening all and welcome. Just a quick announcement before the video begins. Next week I have a marathon of new content. From Monday to Friday, all new stories, longer videos. You're gonna love it. So be sure to press subscribe and the bell icon for good measure to be notified and hopefully see you then. But for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This story takes place a little over a year ago some weekday around midnight in central Ohio. I want to preface this by saying that I'm not particularly religious, nor do I necessarily believe in ghosts or the supernatural, but something weird happened that night that I cannot explain. This story is 100% true, except for a few details that have been changed for the sake of anonymity. Let's call it Wednesday. It was around 5 p.m., and a friend tells me about an abandoned building her friend showed her the day before and asks if I want to check it out sometime. Of course I do, but being the curious soul that I am, I wanted to go that night, whereas she could not. I asked a few other friends to make the journey with me, and all declined either because they weren't into the whole breaking and entering and trespassing thing, or they were otherwise busy. So I decided to go alone. This isn't something I usually do as I have a few close friends who are just as experienced as I in the urbex scene, and the three of us make an excellent team when it comes to stuff like this. I've gone to places alone before, but never with this little research done on the area. I couldn't find anything on the internet about the place, so I decided to say screw it and go. As I'm not one to back down from an opportunity like this, so I grab my bag, flashlight, camera, and I'm on my way. I tell someone exactly where I'll be in case something happens and to call the police if I stop responding for a few hours. I arrive about a mile from the location and start my journey. Most of it is woods and creeks, but the last bit of it is a dilapidated parking lot. I get to the lot and see not one, but two buildings to explore. This is turning out to be better than I expected. I choose to go into the building on the left as it looks more easily accessible, and I start looking for a way in. Around the back, I find some metal stairs that have been overgrown and look like they're close to collapsing, and decide to take my chances and slowly climb them, keeping my eyes on each step to make sure I'm not gonna fall through anything. I climb the stairs just fine and go to the second floor. The door is closed, but with a minimal amount of force opens just fine. No padlock or anything. And just like that, I'm in. I look around with my flashlight. This place is in better shape than a lot of abandoned buildings around my location. Part of the roof had been caved in from a falling tree, but everything else looked good. I walk around the entrance room a bit more and realize where I am. There are note cards all over the floor with basic information on people. First and last names, addresses, date of births, diagnosis codes, and inpatient or outpatient with a check next to one. I am in a psychiatrist's office. Nice. I love these kind of places, and insane asylums are some of my favorites to explore. I have a seat and look through some of the patient cards. I look up diagnosis codes and try and get a profile of the person. For no particular reason, just interesting stuff. After a bit of this, I stand up to continue my journey. Now the way this building is set up is basically a giant letter I, with the entrance stairs I used at the bottom and a boarded up main entrance in the center. The only set of stairs to the first floor are at the top of the eye. I look around some of the second floor rooms and don't really see much, mostly empty offices with a chair or lamp in the room. I do, however, find a room that I assume was for children to play in while their parents were seeing a psychiatrist. It has a sandbox and some toys lying around, but I noticed that someone had taken their time to use the sand to draw a pentagram on the floor, and I chuckled. After seeing everything I needed to on the second floor, I go down to the first. The stairs are steep and winding, but very sturdy and I check the door to make sure it won't lock behind me and make my way down. 
The first floor is basically just a long hallway with rooms along one side and a reception area on the other. I start checking out the rooms on the right side and after a few interesting rooms, break room, kitchen, storage closet with Christmas stuff inside, I come across this office with something interesting on the desk. Before getting to that, I want to pose a question. Why does every abandoned building have Christmas stuff in it? Like seriously, 90% of the buildings I've been to have fake trees, wreaths, garlands or something like that. What gives? Anyway, back to the show. So, on the desk in this office is a set of post-it notes. On these notes are messages that make me feel a little uneasy and they go like this. He's planning on letting the hostage out, 4.30. Do we have staff accountability yet? 4.35. Can Officer John escort Jane out the room? 4.42. This is where things got weird. And I snapped a picture and took them on my phone so that I could send them to my friends. As soon as I take the picture on my phone, the entire building begins to shake violently. My first thought was earthquake. Now, I'm not speaking from experience, but I have to assume an old, dilapidated building is not the type of place you want to be in during an earthquake. So I start to make my way out, only this time rather briskly. As I get upstairs, I notice the door I propped open to keep from locking me out was now only slightly ajar. The small piece of metal I propped it open with was nowhere to be seen, although I didn't look very hard. As I'm walking slash jogging my way out through this gyrating building, I noticed that every door I had opened upstairs was now closed tight. What the hell, was someone messing with me? I didn't want to stick around and find out. As I was leaving the larger room I entered through, I noticed the door I came in was shut. I pulled on it, but nothing. The door wouldn't open. Now I'm pretty calm under pressure, but this one was beginning to be too much. I was starting to freak out a bit, and I made the quick decision to force my way out. Typically, I hate doing any damage to a building I'm exploring and usually try to avoid it wherever possible. But this was a special case. I wanted to get the hell out of there. Kick the door down? I've done it before, but this door didn't seem like it was going anywhere. It opened the other way and was very sturdy. Guess I'm kicking out the press board covering the window next to it. Luckily, these windows were huge and low enough where I could get a foot on the wood. Two kicks and the wood gives out. The building is still shaking, and I make a hasty getaway down the stairs. This is the part that still spooks me. As soon as my feet hit the ground on the last step, the building stops shaking, completely. Everything around me was silent. I must have been going crazy. I know what I felt, I know what I saw. I got out of there and didn't look back. A few weeks later, my crew freed up and wanted me to show them the place even after I told them the story. Oddly enough, every other time I've been there, nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm not sure what happened nor why, and I'm not one to believe it was a ghost or anything. But I'd be lying if I said it didn't shake me up. Was it just a well-timed earthquake? Possibly. But I heard nothing about it on the news the next day, and nobody else said they felt or heard anything. Any insight, whether it be spiritual, geographic, or anything related, would be wonderful and appreciated. Also, final note, I tried to go back to the building a few months ago, as a colleague and I now dabble in paranormal investigations, and the buildings from these stories were now demolished, both of them. It's quite sad to see them go, but I still can't find a trace of them online. It seems like this was all done rather quickly and under the radar. I was around 13 or 12 years old. I don't quite remember the date. I've always been a big, childish person, partly because of a car accident when I entered medium school that felt like it stopped my growth mentally. I barely had any friends because I was going through the whole weird looks bullying thing. And the only ones that were okay to hang out with me were younger people, or the people with the same mindset I had. Every year, my parents would send me to a summer camp lost in the mountains, where there were basically mountain activities like hiking, exploring forests, and all of that. For reference, 
I live in France, and I don't know how summer camps elsewhere work, but here it's basically an age classification. There were three groups, blue, youngers, yellow, medium, and green elder. I was supposed to go into the yellow group because I was still too young, but for some reason I got brought to the green group composed of people that were 16 or 17, and everyone hated me for being so young and childish. The day I remember was one of the last. The instructors that were keeping an eye on us brought us to the deepest spot of the forest to have a picnic, and after that, they looked after us and asked us if we wanted to play hide and seek. Everyone was probably too old for that, but they were still setting things up, to which most refused to even hide. I was a kid, of course, and was overexcited when they started counting, and I ran as fast as I could to a place super far away so they wouldn't find me. There was a smallish river. I jumped over it and after some steps felt a hand catching my hairs very violently. I tried to turn myself, but the hand just slipped to my neck and caught me hard. I was terrified and tried to fight back and to resist, but the hand that was restraining me was one of an overgrown man with a lot of strength. I started to scream at the top of my lungs and I'd never screamed that loudly before, but seemingly no one heard me and the guy began talking while dragging me into the forest. He was furious and kept repeating, You'll see. I hurt you so much you're gonna cry and scream more. I remember him talking about harming me, raping me. I was just 13. I was so terrified. I've never lived any physical abuse, no hitting, nothing. That was more than words. He dragged me further into the forest and I kept screaming, hitting him until at some point I found a way to bite his hand with all the strength of my jaw. He screamed and backed away from the pain as his arm retracted. I escaped, turned back, and made the mad sprint of my life. I think the guy lost interest in me because he didn't run after me. I jumped back over the river and found my one only friend in the whole camp. I don't know if she saw what happened at all. And I went to the instructors, but was too terrified to do anything or even tell them, so I didn't. I didn't know who it was. I didn't know if it was someone from the camp or a total stranger. I didn't even see his head. His skin, the clothes he was wearing, nothing. I was just too scared. The same night I called my parents, but they couldn't come to collect me. I had to go back home on the bus like everyone else. What terrified me the most was that the guy could be one of the people in the same group as me. For all I know, he could just hit me in my sleep and take me somewhere. I still don't know who that guy is and never want to know. So to this stranger in the forest who wanted to rape a 13 year old girl, Let's not meet. Like most millennials, I have to work multiple jobs to make money, and one of these jobs is driving for Lyft. Last night, a very friendly and pleasant passenger forgot her phone in my car. I didn't discover that until the morning when she sent a notification through Lyft. Since I had other work to do, I didn't get to returning the phone until early this afternoon. By then, my passenger had given me her address, so I drove to her apartment to return the phone. Now, this apartment has a very narrow one-way road running in front of it, but it was empty since it was the middle of the day, so I parked my car on the road with the hazard lights on to return the phone. It took me a few minutes at most to figure out where to leave the phone, and once I left the phone somewhere safe, I saw a lady in a red car pull up behind me and ran down the stairs to go grab my car. She rolled down the window and asked if I was looking for someone. I told her I had found who I was looking for, jumped back into my car while she was still speaking, and drove out of her way and out of the apartment complex. That should have been the end of it. I decided to drive to Starbucks since I was hungry and going through caffeine withdrawals, so I stayed on the main road and headed that way. That's when I noticed something peculiar. The lady was following right behind me, but since that road leads to practically everything else in my city, I didn't think anything of it, until I signaled to turn left to go to a shopping area and noticed that she was still behind me. Growing suspicious, after I made my left turn, I turned suddenly into a road that led into a bank and other small businesses, not realizing it was one way. When I reached the dead end, I turned around and headed back to the main road only to realize this lady was still stalking me. 
In panic, I reached the main road, turned into another parking lot and cut through to a local movie theatre and kept driving until I was sure I had lost her. When I noticed the lady wasn't following me anymore, I drove to Starbucks, got my food and drink and returned home, played some video games and other stuff and ran upstairs to tell my story on Reddit, only to discover that Lyft had emailed me, issuing a deactivation warning for unsafe driving. Of course I can't say with certainty, but given what I've just said, I think it was the stalker that reported me. One of the times I was homeless, I think in 2015 or so, it had been about eight months and I'd gotten to the swing of being homeless like I had a routine of what I could do and stuff. One day I'm sitting beside this construction yard, waiting for the dealer to come by, and this random dude comes out of nowhere. He starts talking crazy, and I immediately realize there's something wrong with this guy mentally. Just his actions and the way he moved his head, and the way he spoke sort of like a deaf person told me there was something wrong with him. But we spoke for a while, and he started getting into this story about aliens and UFOs, and that's my kind of stuff. So I'm like, nice. And he sees I get visibly more excited about talking to him, and he starts drawing on the sand on the floor. I used to play a lot of Kerbal Space Program, and I know a bit about the stars, and I realize that this dude is 100% correct in everything he's saying. He draws Pleiades, then draws the Earth, and explains how one can go from here to there, using correct terminology and everything. Apoapsis, periapsis, gravity turn, etc. But then he points to a spot in the middle between the Earth and Pleiades and says, but this is where they will stop you if you try and go. Now I'm super interested and I'm like, who? He says there are people with metal wings who travel without spaceships. And when they touch down to Earth, they fly and land like birds and then their wings turn to bone and flesh and they become arms. But if they stay too long, their bones inside their arms become rock and they can't fly anymore. So they choose to do evil things to draw attention until they can get fetched by others. He starts drawing weird symbols and shapes on the sand and he starts getting things like Fruit Loopy and starts kind of grabbing me and shouting and getting weird with me so I get defensive. He jumps up, turns around, pulls his pants down and shows his bare ass from upper thigh to lower back and there's just one big open wound. It's literally just meat and blood and pus, and I'm like, dude, you have to get to a hospital. But he says, no. But they won't be able to help him now. And I'm freaking out a little because this is clearly someone with serious issues who's been hurt or needs something. My dealer finally arrived at the right time. I say goodbye and take off, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? My dealer and I both knew all the faces around the area, but we didn't know this guy. I come back around the area a few minutes later and he's gone. I ended up spending the night inside a big concrete pipe in the construction yard about 100 meters away from where this all took place. It's 2am, I'm sitting there smoking in the dark when I hear the most intense blood-curdling scream you've ever heard and shouting. No. No. Please. I could recognize his voice. I come crawling out of the pipe. There's another homeless dude who I knew also crawling out of the dark just outside of the construction yard. We're both recognizing each other and are like, dude, what should we do? He immediately turns away and says that we should leave. All the while, the guy is still screaming just up the road. My buddy takes off into the darkness and I'm just standing there for a few seconds and I see two human-sized things, literally, that look like people with wings taking off into the sky and vanishing almost instantly. Then the screaming stops. I'm trying to figure out if my eyes are playing tricks on me, if it's because I'm hallucinating because I'm on drugs, but I'm not sure. I go and check on him, and there's literally just a pile of his clothes and his shoes where he was sitting a little while earlier. Never heard or saw him again. Neither did any of my other homeless buddies. I've been thinking about that dude quite a bit lately. My sister, who passed away in October, had an ex-husband called Todd. He's six foot tall, and while I'm four foot nine, I'm hardly very intimidating. But due to who I know, I can scare creepers pretty well. But Todd is a whole nother class of creepy. 
Now I did not know he had a dummy account on Facebook, and I was talking to friends about attending an anime con alone. My fiance Rick backed out, and said he'd pick me up for dinner. On the day of the con, I was dropped off with my panel gear, and was set to meet at the hotel with two friends, Danny, a girlfriend, and Jade. They let me keep my stuff in the hotel room, so that I could enjoy the con, get my badge and prepare for two panels that I was running, Japanese mythology and fandom pride. I was excited but also felt weirded out. I did not own a smartphone back then, or would have gotten texts from my sister. Apparently, the messages I did not get informed me that Todd and his new girlfriend were at the convention, and he was looking for me. So around 9pm, I finished my first panel, and Jay treated me to some food if you call going to 7-Eleven for hot dogs food. We were enjoying it in the lobby when Todd, who I didn't even recognize, came over. He was hanging on the side of a seat, and he was drunk as hell. I asked what the hell he was doing there, and he asked me why I wasn't home, minding my fiance like a good girlfriend. I was a little surprised by that, and went back to Jade and Danny's room to call Rick. Sure enough, Rick said he was coming to the hotel and to wait in the room. We did and I heard something I never wanted to hear coming from the hall. Someone shouted, He has a knife! Danny looked out the door and saw Todd coming down the hall yelling for me. I went pale and wanted to hide in the bathroom, I felt sick. Danny closed and locked the door hoping Todd didn't see us. Todd was caught, but it was so dim in the halls of the hotel no one could tell. He was banned for the con, thank goodness. Rick stayed with me all night when he arrived and helped me with the last panel. We decided to stop going to conventions for a year, and my sister and mum opted to extend the no contact order onto Rick and I against Todd. We have not seen Todd in three years and hope to never do so again. When I was eight or nine, I had gone to our local Walmart with my grandpa to pick up groceries. While my grandpa was checking out, I asked him if I could go to the subway attached to the Walmart to buy a sub because I was hungry and didn't want to wait to eat at home. My grandpa, being the loving man he was, wanted me to be happy, so gave me some money and told me I could order myself while he finished paying for the groceries. The subway entrance was maybe 20 feet from where my grandpa was standing in line, so he could easily see me the whole time I walked over to order. I also want to mention that we lived in a very small and relatively safe town. Scary things didn't happen to people, and this lulled my grandpa and I into a false sense of security, trusting that I would be safe walking 20 feet to the subway alone. I don't blame my grandpa for anything. This was something that a lot of parents would have allowed their children to do. I quickly walked the short distance to subway, thinking of all the stuff I was going to pile on top of my sub. I got up to the counter and noticed immediately that the only other people in the subway were three middle-aged men talking. I ignored them at first, not thinking anything could be wrong. After all, in my little kid brain, I had no reason to think strangers would be interested in me, even though my parents had given me stranger danger talks, which probably did end up helping me, or maybe even potentially saving my life. I ordered the sub with no problem and paid my money. The cashier was very uninterested in me, and looking back, I could tell she didn't want to deal with a kid, so she quickly made my sub then disappeared into the back. I stood there alone for a moment, collecting my change, and safely tucking it away in my pocket. I didn't notice the men, until all three of them were standing right behind me. When I turned around, they caught me off guard. They were all smiling at me in a creepy way, and I instantly felt dread in my stomach and became very uncomfortable. Finally, one of the men spoke up, and in a thick accent said, You are very beautiful. What is your name? This scared me because I knew older strange men should not be asking my name or commenting on how I looked. Something in me told me to lie, so I said, My name's Ashley. Needless to say, this is not my real name, and the other two men were standing behind him and just creepily smiling and staring at me the whole time, not saying a word. The same man that spoke the first time said, Ah, Ashley, what a beautiful name. Do you want to come with us and have some fun? 
All my alarm bells were ringing in my little kid brain. I panicked and started desperately looking around for my grandpa. I noticed him, still standing at the checkout line, oblivious to what was happening. The man took a step towards me, and I did the only thing I could think of. I ran. I ran faster than I ever have before and straight to my grandpa and never looked behind me. So I don't know if the men tried to come after me or anything. Thankfully, I never saw them again. When I got to my grandpa, he was finishing up paying for the groceries, gave me a stern look for running through the store, as he probably thought I was just trying to be obnoxious. I suppose he didn't notice the men. I hurried my grandpa along, and we left the store safely and quickly. After we got home, I told my grandpa what happened. He was furious. He wanted to go back and report the men. I don't know if he ever did, but he wanted to beat the crap out of them. My grandpa was a big guy and strong for his age and probably could have taken them. So creepy middle-aged men who tried to get little girls to follow them. Let's not meet. I was 16 years old when I had just gotten my license. It was on a Friday after school and I was hanging out with some of my friends from another school district. My girlfriend and her best friend. We all live in small, rural towns that have absolutely nothing to do in a 40-mile radius except a Walmart in between and a few Sheets gas stations. Since there was nothing to do, we used to go ghost hunting. It pretty much meant finding abandoned buildings and checking them out. None of us really ever experienced anything supernatural, but it was an interesting time and it involved doing something with friends. I had seen a house off the highway a few times that I wanted to check out, so I told them about it. They all agreed that it was a good idea. We decided to stop at Walmart on our way to grab a new flashlight, and I wanted batteries for my camera. Two of my friends and I bought a flashlight and two packs of batteries each, and I bought a four pack for my camera. We have a habit of keeping the batteries that come with flashlights as emergency backups because they don't seem to last as long. Armed with new flashlights, batteries and energy drinks, we were more than ready to head to the house. The house was a two-story one with a basement, all broken down, and was about a half mile off the highway in the middle of a huge field. You could pretty much see it on the hill the whole hike. Just seeing it standing there with moonlight shining through it was creepy, let alone the idea of going in it. There was also a barn that had fallen down about 50 yards from the right side. The closer and closer we walked, the weirder and weirder it felt. Hair-raising weird. The front porch steps were broken, so we had to climb up to the porch to get in. Stepping over the debris from other people busting the place up, we made our way. On our way through the living room to the kitchen, my girlfriend claimed she felt someone pulling the hood on her sweatshirt. But I was the last person, and I was several feet behind. I figured she was either so scared that she was imagining things, or just saying stuff to try and freak everyone out. We made our way around the kitchen, and were on our way upstairs, when she gasped and spun around, claiming she felt her hood being pulled and that I was an ass for trying to scare her. I swore it wasn't me, and we continued taking pictures all the way up. We made it all the way to the top of the stairs, and I saw a big hole in the attic, so I started walking towards it to take a picture. I snapped one on the way to it, and then another a little closer. The attic stairs were in a room to the left, and there was a hallway with rooms off to the right. We all went to the attic first to check it out which was all the way up, and there was an old wooden ladder and a broken crate. We walked back down to the second floor, quite disappointed. At that point, I was the only one with a flashlight out, so everyone followed me through the hallway to a room on the end to the left. It seemed really breezy in the room compared to the rest of the house, even though there were broken open windows all throughout. After the last person was about three steps in, my flashlight went out. It was still turned on, but it seemed like it went dead. The first thing I thought was, there's no way these brand new batteries went dead in 20 minutes in an LED flashlight. Almost instantly after, I heard someone say, 
My phone's dead. Yeah, mine too. From my girlfriend and her best friend. One of my other friends pulled out their flashlight, flicked it on and off, and nothing happened. I pulled my camera from my pocket, took a picture with the hope of maybe catching something weird, but the screen was black, with a flashing red dead battery symbol. At that point, we were all weirded out and practically fighting each other to leave. Once we made it to the stairs, the flashlight worked again. My camera had about three quarters of a battery bar, and the cell phones were able to be powered back on. I got goosebumps and tensed up, and we hastened our pace down the stairs and figured the easiest way out would be through the basement door that we saw under the porch on our way in, since the porch stairs were broken. Sadly, it wasn't the least creepy way. We made our way down through the basement that turned out to be a basic maze and looked like it had been in the Blair Witch Project. We fought our way through the vines that had grown over the door to the outside and made our way from the house. About 200 yards from the house, we heard what sounded like a tin food can being spiked on the ground and then rolling down from the basement steps. I don't even remember seeing a tin can anywhere in the house, and we all began running as fast as we could while being careful not to trip over something in the high weeds. Once we returned to the car, we tried to theorize what the hell just happened, and I started looking through all the pictures. They all just looked like dust particle ridden pictures of an old house, except for one. When I snapped the two pictures of the attic, the first was just like all the others, but the second had a thick, white smoky mist over the hole. It wasn't cold, just a coolish night, so there's no way it would have been breath mist and no one smoked. To this day I get goosebumps and a little glassy eyed every time I look through these pictures. I posted them to a forum for people into the paranormal and everyone told me I had to make an interesting experience post and that I'd taken a very interesting picture. My girlfriend and I had been dating for around three years, and I have never had an experience that was as close of a call as this time. We are mostly nocturnal creatures, especially when we're used to working the night shift at a factory together. To us, midnight used to be like noon, and we loved going out to the store around this time because we are usually the only two of 10 people in the place, including staff. One night a year or so ago, we were doing our normal Saturday evening shop at around midnight, when I got the strangest feeling, not even five minutes into our journey. It constantly felt like we were being followed, but every time I would look, there'd be no one there. I eventually wrote this off as paranoia and started to have a good time and make an adventure out of the trip. We were finishing up on the non-grocery side of Walmart taking the long straightaway roads towards the groceries so we can get down to business on getting food. My girlfriend was telling me about her last attempts and statistics of her shiny hunt in Pokemon Ultra when I finally noticed him. I heard a slight clicking noise and looked back casually to see a man pushing a bicycle alongside him, walking a few steps back. It was brand new like he had just pulled it off the rack as he walked past and was staring at me and I got a bad feeling. I positioned myself on the other side of my girlfriend so that I was between him and her purse, which raised red flags to her. I told her to keep walking and act natural. A few minutes go by and the man makes a mad dash around a median chip display towards us, stopped dead when he saw we didn't flinch. Now I'm not exactly a muscular guy, but I suppose my six foot four stature made him nervous about what I was capable of since I was wearing heavy winter clothing. I never broke eye contact until he turns around and walks back in the direction he was following us from and vanished. For about 30 minutes we shopped around, wondering if I was just being paranoid still, and we disregarded it as much. That is, until we were checking out. As I finished checking out the groceries and got ready to pay, I saw the same man on the bicycle with the front basket full of food and a woman's purse in his right hand, pedaling as hard as he could. An employee made an attempt to grab him that was too slow and he got away. Then we asked a nearby employee if we just saw what we think we did and told them about what happened with us. And they said they weren't allowed to tell us anything and threatened to charge us with trespassing if we didn't leave immediately. To this day, I have no idea if they ever caught the guy or got the purse back. 
We still joke about this, and her family says that it's possible I could have died if I fought back. But figure if he had a gun, he wouldn't have hesitated like when he did when he finally caught up to us. I'm going to take you back a few years to when I was working at McDonald's. For context at the time, I was a 16-year-old female. Now at the McDonald's I worked at, when you are on headset, you answer people at the drive through You are normally required to be at the first window to also take payment. My job position was customer care manager at the time, so my job was to be on the front desk, but 99% of the time, they required me to be behind tills. So I was having a normal day, working a long shift, but having a normal work day. I happened to be on headset, and first window that day too. My headset buzzes, letting me know there's someone at my drive through lane. I go through to the first window to answer my customer, and this is how the conversation ensued. Hello, welcome to McDonald's, what can I get you? Oh wow, you got a beautiful voice. His voice was grunty and husky sounding. Not off-putting, we have all sorts of customers come through McDonald's every day, so it didn't give me the creeps or anything. Thank you sir, how very flattering. What can I get you? I haven't decided yet. There's a long pause here. Can I come to the first window to decide? I want to see who I'm talking to. Now we weren't very busy at this point. The creeper hadn't actually creeped me out. I mean, all he'd done was pay me a compliment, and we quite often had people complaining that they preferred face-to-face -face contact, so this certainly wasn't out of the blue or unusual. Yeah, sure sir, that's fine. Wow, you're as beautiful as you sound. Thank you sir, have you decided what you're going to order? Are you an option? I laughed nervously at this. It was my first job and I wasn't the rude kind of person where someone was paying me a compliment. I must also point out this guy must have been in at least his 60s. I remember he had one lazy eye that looked to the left, painfully awful teeth, and patchy dark brown hair. At this point, I was a little bit uncomfortable, but was still more than willing to take his order. I'll have a cheeseburger. Okay, sir, that'll be 99p. Are you paying cash or card? Without answering my question, he started asking me where I'm from, how old I was, etc. But it wasn't until his last question that I got super weirded out. What time do you finish work? Half seven, why? I didn't actually finish at half seven, but half seven was the first number that came into my head when I blurted it out. I finished at eight and would probably do some overtime too, but I wasn't about to let him know that. I can meet you if you want. I can pick you up outside and we can go somewhere. All the while he's saying this, he has this horrendous grin on his face and keeps winking at me. I'm really sorry, sir. I'm not allowed to meet customers outside of work. It's against employee policy. This was utter bull, but I needed him to leave me alone. And he carries on being insistent, but not getting the picture. And I cut the conversation short. Anyway, sir, sorry to be rude, but can I have the 99p for your cheeseburger? Ah, yes, sorry. See you at half seven. Off he drove to the next window and I was gobsmacked. I'd already said I wasn't going to see him. I was a little bit shocked, but was not going over there to give him the satisfaction of talking to me again. My coworker came to me and said, Ew, that guy had a major crush on you. I wanted your number, but I didn't give it to him. He's old enough to be your dad if not older. Anyway, I explained exactly what happened and how uncomfortable it made me. Half seven came around and my co-workers spooked. The creeper was actually waiting in the car park for me, just like he said he would. He sat halfway down the car park and you could see him just staring in. Our car park wasn't very big. It only had four rows of parking spaces, so he wasn't that far away and would have clocked me the minute I walked out the door. At this point, I'm freaking out and head to the back of the store where hopefully he can't see me. I had to stay in the back of the store for 40 minutes before we knew it was safe to come out. Fast forward a week and Creeper is back on drive through and guess who's back on headset at window one? Me. I heard his voice and recognized it straight away. I was hoping I'd hear your voice again. Why didn't you meet me the other day? Uh, one second, sir. I'll be with you in one second. I immediately handed my headset to my manager 
and gave him a quick briefing of the situation. He gladly took the headset and dealt with the customer from start to finish. When my manager came back to me to let me know he'd gone, he said the creeper had been asking my name, my address, and my surname. My manager said he was the most creepiest guy he'd ever met, and I was never to have anything to do with him again. If he came back to work while I was there afterwards, my manager would have to head me to the back room while he dealt with him. He still asked about me every time. So to the creepy McDonald's guy, let's never meet again. In Canada, we have a scout system similar to the US. Our system is by level. Beavers, cubs, scouts, and venturers. This happened during cubs. So there was this house on the property of camp. Beautiful house, nice wooden smell, it was great. During this time, all the troops around us gathered for a weekend up at the house, and there were maybe six or seven troops gathered. We would be doing wooden car racing and stuff. The house was split into two rooms, one for males and one for females and there was a closet door connected to each room. At the time, there were maybe 10 to 20 guys in one room, and maybe 10 to 15 females. We would all be sleeping on the floors with our sleeping bags. After brushing, me and the guys went back down to the guy's room. We were talking and one of the kids said that this place was haunted, and that the closet that leads into the girl's section was where someone was hanged. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I always had a strange feeling about the doorway. So much, in fact, that I specifically put my sleeping bag across the other side of the room. There was also an air vent there, and I was afraid as well. So I then moved it into the middle. Even if I had to sleep in between two guys, I didn't mind. That night after the counselors shushed us to sleep, because you know, guys, we talk for hours on end if we're told not to sleep. It was around maybe 4.30 when I awoke. My head was facing towards the closet when I noticed something going down. The closet door was slowly opened. I was kind of stunned. Girls shouldn't be peeping on guys. That's when I see a shadow no bigger than six feet. It was crazy tall for its size. Now best I can describe it for memory is like the color Vanta Black, Google it. It was very blurry, but crisp until the middle. It slowly inched its way across the wooden floorboards with no sound, silently passing each kid as it went by. I didn't want this thing to see me, so I turned my head and it passed more kids. The more it went down, I was now trembling. I didn't know what it wanted. It kept moving slowly, passing a few kids ahead of me. And then it happened. The more it approached me, the more I felt dread. Not only did I feel dread, but the air got colder, and not just like the physical cold feeling, it felt cold in my insides. The air got more dry and cold, like liquid nitrogen. The greatest amount of that feeling happened when it passed me. I was maybe a few feet to the door, so when it went to the other entrance I was at, this thing was literally turning the doorknob. It pulled the door open and slowly exited before, strangely enough, shutting the door behind itself. That morning, we were getting up from bed and walked down the rickety old steps. One of the kids said, did you guys see that shadow last night? And maybe four kids' eyes widened. We all blurted out that we had. We talked about it for a short while, and let's just say after that experience, everyone's sleeping bag was moved to the other side of the room. My mum passed away when I was 12 from a brain aneurysm. She'd been sick one weekend and finally went to the doctor that Monday. They misdiagnosed it as a really bad migraine. When I got home from school that day, she was barely hanging on and couldn't talk anymore. She was rushed to the ER and underwent surgery and survived. She stayed in the ICU for a week in an induced coma. We stayed there too, waiting. The day before she passed away, a nurse came in to tell us that my mum had woken up and wanted to talk to us. The nurse also said that she would overlook the visit and limit the schedule in the ICU so we should go in. When we went in to see my mum, she was sitting up and talking. She spoke to each of us individually 
then asked my dad to hug and kiss her. Another nurse came in and said we had to leave, as only two were allowed in and it wasn't visiting time yet, plus they had to do her vitals. We told her about the nurse who let us in to see her, and she said that there was no one there that fit that description, and we never saw that nurse again. My mum then took a turn for the worse, and never woke up again. I'm a 26-year-old female living in a big city. I work every day, even during the pandemic, and take public transportation to work, so I've dealt with my fair share of men aggressively trying to talk to me, or even sometimes look for a fight. I put a deposit down on my own apartment, so I was across the city dropping my deposit off. It started pouring, so instead of making the arduous journey home on the bus, on transfer, and lots of walking, and I didn't have a raincoat, I decided to call a lift. My driver gets there, pulls up, and is motioning for me to get in. I notice he isn't wearing a face mask, so when he rolls the window down, I say, oh, hi, I'll just wait for you to put your mask on. He then comes out with, what the hell does it look like in my hand? I was a bit taken aback. Oh, I'm just waiting for both of us. He hesitated a second, then gave me an angry scowl. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like this from a stranger, just pure anger. Like, if I were in front of him, he would have murdered me. I swear it was that intense. He then said, Do you think I need you to tell me to put it on? Uh, no, I'm just waiting, I reply. He then gave me a look again and sped off. Not before calling me a very few choice swear words. Of course, I reported him to Lyft, but the best part of the story is the strangers that backed me up. One woman said that she saw what was going on and that it was messed up. And the two older men who waited with me while I cried for my next ride provided words of comfort. Not everyone's that bad, but the crappy ones are truly the worst. My mum brought up an interesting point, as that since I probably got this guy fired, he's gonna have even more violent rage. I certainly hope he didn't get my name and address from Lyft. I was exploring an abandoned multi-level tech school building for fun and creepy sensations about nine years ago, when I thought I heard voices cooing down from the floor above me. I was already feeling a bit like Diablo, given how many spiders I had to kill just to get where I was. Then a rat fell out of a vent duct behind me, and I realized the voices were the augmented chatter of rodents. The walls were full of them. I mostly poked around and then got the hell out of there. Also eerie on that trip, in the bomb shelter portion of the building, there was a roasting spit that some homeless person had set up, and there was a dog skeleton where the fire would have been. Sad and disturbing that someone would be driven to eat an animal capable of empathy. But desperate times, I suppose. This happened 19 years ago, when I was 19, and just moved into my first real house with roommates that I picked. We decided to head to Walmart to pick up some house things and whatnot. Six of us go. It's myself plus four female roommates and one roommate's boyfriend called Daniel. We head to Walmart in my 98 Bronco 2, Hasis, the most badass vehicle to ever vehicle. We get there, and start shopping in a perfectly normal fashion. I mean, we're being loud and obnoxious young adults, but that's normal. Now, for the story's sake, I need to let you know that I am a talker. I talk to everyone. I compliment strangers, say hello if we make eye contact while walking, that sort of thing. I will not say that I do not know a stranger because I am terribly shy when I'm alone, but when in a group, I am very outgoing and friendly. And that was my mistake this evening. We're two hours in, and we pass this dude, probably our age, but no one can really tell. As I glance up, we make eye contact, so I feel obligated to say hello. And we all go about our merry way. Only, he went about our merry way. We are in this store for a solid 45 minutes, haven't even gotten halfway through, and he crosses our paths again. He walks up to me with his head down, like with his chin to his chest, sticks out his hand and says, Here then rushes away. It's his phone number. 
Aw oh, man, that's super sweet. I feel bad having no intention of calling him, but it was a sweet gesture, or so I thought. It had now been the better part of two hours, going down every aisle discussing as adults what we do or do not need. We thought we were so grown. Let's discuss whether these trash bags are cost efficient before buying them in a group, all huddled up like adults do. And we cross paths with him once more. He stops in the middle of the aisle and just stares at us as we pass. I'm a little weirded out and so is Daniel, the roomie's boyfriend, and he grabs my hand and starts acting like he's my boyfriend. The guy proceeds to follow us through the remainder of our journey. We get to the checkout. There are five girls, each with a full cart. Poor cashier. I know she was just done. And we see him four lanes away checking out with a soda. Daniel is getting uneasy and pissed off, so he grabs my waist and loudly shouts, let's go, babe, or some stuff like that. And we walk out. He walks out with us. We get to my car and begin loading things, and this guy goes to his car and just sits there staring. Daniel is now standing near the back of the car with a rubber mallet just smacking it into his hand like he's a mobster, thinking it would make the guy leave. But it did not. We finish loading and pile in to head out. I turn my vehicle on, and the dude's vehicle starts as well. We pull out and head home normally until Daniel, who's been watching these headlights like a hawk, says, don't go home. Drive to the police station or a firehouse or something. That guy's been behind us since we left Walmart. All five of the 19-year-old girls he's in the car with start freaking out. The dude stays with us until we turn into a fire station and he kept going and we sat in the parking lot for a good 20 minutes to half hour, looking to see if he'd come back. He didn't, and we head home. This event is why I haven't been back to Walmart since. I still talk to random strangers though. I can't help it, I really like people. But to the Walmart creep, let's not meet again. This took place back in 2016. I, at the time, was a 16-year-old girl at a summer camp. This summer camp took place at a college about 45 minutes away from me. I was there for filmmaking and knew everyone in the program. Yes, there were other programs such as dance, drama, and visual arts, but there was still a limited amount of people. The film camp lasted longer than all of the other ones, so by the last week, there were about 50 of us on campus, so you remember faces. There was a certain spot on campus where a lot of people would go to watch the sunset. Two of my friends and I decided to sit out there. There were many people to begin with, so we felt comfortable. I should have mentioned this earlier, but the campus is located in the sketchier part of town, and there are gates at the entrance from the outside. As it got darker and darker, more and more people went back to their dorms. The three of us stayed out even in the dark. And there were street lamps and I had my camera and one friend has her laptop. So it isn't pitch black. It's around 9.30 and a man walked in front of us. We waved and smiled as he walked by. The only thing is I've never seen him before. Even a week ago before all of the other sessions left, I had never seen him before, and at most there had been 250 people on campus. I tell my friends that it's kind of creeping me out, that I've never seen him before, but the one with the laptop said it's nothing to worry about, seeing as there was campus security doing a checkup on a building near us. Ten minutes go by, and he walks in front of us again. After he leaves, the friend with the laptop, in a worried voice, says, We need to go. So we grab all our belongings and are walking fast back to the dorms. I get her to explain to me why she was worried. She said that when he walked by again, he looked over his shoulder and did a head nod in the distance. And when she looked over, she saw another man in the darkness. We laughed it off as we got closer to the dorms, but all I could think about to myself was, why didn't we leave when I said we should? Nobody ever listens to me, even though I have great intuition. Anyway, to the creepy men who seemingly were planning on mugging us, or worse, let's not meet. As a kid, my grandmother lived in a different country. She was super affectionate, 
but due to a severe back problem, she couldn't give many hugs. So the most physical touch we had was holding hands. She always had the most tender and warm hands, even on the coldest days or when the air conditioning was on. We used to sit and talk for hours well into my teens. When I was 21, she suddenly passed away from a stroke. My last words to her before I saw her were, I love you very, very much. And that really comforted me at the time. In accordance with Jewish culture, we bury our dead. And since I am one of the only males in the family, I bore the brunt of digging most of the grave. I was exhausted and sad from the whole day that I didn't get to express my emotions until the evening when I got home. I rushed to my room and let my emotions out. Cold and drained from working so hard and especially being outside during winter, as I lay on my bed, my entire body cold, suddenly, a weird feeling of warmth I could feel on my hands. It became searing hot, almost like I had a fever. I felt so eerily calm and placid. I knew that she was there that night, holding my hand and saying goodbye. I haven't actually felt sad since, as I got to say my final goodbye. I work odd hours. Sometimes I'm coming into work at 5 a.m., sometimes I'm leaving at 5 a.m. Most of my shifts are nights, but I have two 12-hour day shifts. Side note, I was 41 at this point, female, rather heavy set, and somewhat plain and dressed in my work uniform. Blue security shirt and navy cargo pants. Not exactly the definition of alluring. One morning, I was early. So I stopped at the Tim Hortons near my workplace, which is an area that gets a lot of young university students, tech workers, and industrial workers. I went in, ordered, paid, and left. I had been the only person in the lot when I entered the store, and had been the only customer in the store. It was very early, and still dark out. When I came out with my coffee and muffin, I noticed one of the ubiquitous Waterloo taxi cabs parked right next to my old car a dark grey sedan with the logos of the local taxi company emblazed on its side and rear. The entire lot was empty, but this twit parked right beside the driver's side of my car. Instantly my nerves were on edge. The man in the car I'd say was at least in his fifties, somewhat heavy set and looked a little foreign. He was staring at me in a way that just screamed creepy, not even looking away when I skewed him with my glare. Most starers will at least turn their gaze away momentarily when caught being creepy. But this guy was just so blatant about his staring he didn't turn away. His stare turned into an outright glare, so I began to get worried that he was more than just a jerk. I said to myself, screw dignity, and got in on the other passenger's side, climbed into the driver's seat from there, which is no easy feat as I'm larger than the average person and with a physical disability. And as soon as I got into the driver's seat, he started his car and began to circle mine very close. Around and around he goes, glaring at me the whole time. I had no idea what his problem was, but then I remember that there had been some pretty major disputes in Kitchener slash Waterloo between cabbies and Uber drivers, with some Uber drivers being followed and harassed by cabbies in the recent weeks. It had even made the local news a few times. Maybe the guy thought I was an Uber. That didn't make sense to me, though, as I was driving a 17-year-old Subaru that had more rust than paint at that point. No way an Uber would send a car like mine to pick up a customer. As the guy circled me, I thought, maybe I should just leave and head to work even though I'm early. So I put the old beast into drive and waited for the creepy cabbie to drive behind me and just floored it the hell out of there. Of course, he followed. At that point, I figured heading into work would be a very bad idea, as my co-worker left. I'd be there alone for 12 hours, and our office, the whole building really, is a giant fishbowl. All windows, zero privacy. It may be swipe card access only, but if someone was really intending to get in there, all he'd have to do was grab a rock and smash one of those big old floor-to-ceiling windows. So I started making random turns. He followed. I zipped through a red light by going through a corner lock gas station and he followed. I raced through the lots of empty factories near my workplace 
and he followed. By this time, it was growing short on time. The roads were nearly empty, so I couldn't use traffic to get free of him, and I had no choice but to head back towards work. At the time, my building was very big and had enormous lots around it. I pulled into the entrance furthest from where we security guards parked, and the twit followed. But he only got about eight meters in before he stopped. I continued in towards the parking and the office door. When I parked, he was still sitting in the lot. I jumped out the car, grabbed my bag, locked the old beast, and ran into the security office. My co-worker Rob asked if I was okay, as I must have looked as freaked out as I felt. I told him the saga, and he put the lot's camera feed into the monitoring screen so we could see the guy in the lot. He was still there. Rob went outside, and as soon as the cabbie saw Rob, he turned around and booked it. I asked Rob if he'd stay an extra half hour or so in case he returned. Rob's bus didn't come for 45 minutes, so he stayed. We'd gotten the cabbie's license plates and his individual ID number since he'd been circling, and I talked about what to do. I had come to the conclusion that I would call the cab company and complain, but when Rob finally left, I hadn't yet. And after 10 minutes, he texted me. He sent a picture of the cab, which he said was parked in the lot of the gas station not even a block away. I called the police. The cab was long gone when the young constable got there 15 minutes later, and I told him what happened and gave him the plate and cabbie IDs. I did call the cab company too. I got a manager who was clueless, unhelpful, and obviously covering for his driver, and he said he had no cabs with that plate and no cabbies with that ID. All delivered in an accent so thick it was nearly unintelligible. Meanwhile, a few days later, the police called back and said they had paid a visit to the cab company's office, where they had delivered a very stern warning to the manager. I never saw that particular cab again, but as cabbies can switch the cars they're driving at ease and taking their IDs off one car and putting it onto another, I assume the jerk is still out there creeping on single women in parking lots. I don't give a damn about the dispute between cabbies and Ubers. As I see it, the cab companies want business and they need to step up their game and maybe even clean up their cars and bathe their employees and not hire creeps. But still, I wonder if I ended up being mistaken for an Uber driver and that's why he creeped on me and followed me. Anyway, it's not like it was the right thing to do. So creepy cab driver, let's never meet again. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Anyone who is big into paranormal activity is probably aware of a place called the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. It's an old tuberculosis hospital that had a lot of people die in it. Anyway, I did security tour slash caboose video work for them for about two years, from 2005 to 2007. Now I will say this before this, I did not believe in ghosts, spirits, or what have you. It didn't seem possible, but after working and volunteering there, I left fully convinced. Too many experiences to count, but I'll list the ones that got me the most. One morning, after an overnight tour, as people pay $100 to be allowed to row free in the building and ghost hunt for eight hours, another security guard and myself were walking through the building, locking all the doors and such so that we could go home. I was walking down the hallway when suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I saw something or someone run. That was freaky. What really scared the crap out of me was the fact that I also heard bare feet slap the ground as they ran. We took off after them and should have cornered them, but there was nothing there. Scary stuff. Anyone ever watched Celebrity Paranormal Project on VH1? Well, they came and filmed there Gary Busey, Hal Sparks, and some other celebrities. I didn't know were there for that episode. I will tell you, VH1 rigged the hell out of this place. Most of the stuff that happened on this episode didn't really happen. I won't mention what to spoil anything, but still. What was real scary was after a long 12 hour day of myself PAing on set, I stayed behind to do security. Three crew members came after hours to check the place out. And I think it was the camera rigging guy that I took. We went into the building on the third floor and sat in the middle of a hallway. We sat there for a while and I'll never forget, as we were sitting there, I was looking one way as he was looking another. Now I will mention 
that in this building there are five floors with electricity only running to two of them, with the exception of exit signs, you know, fire codes and such. And while I'm looking down the hallway, suddenly, the last room I can see starts to light up from inside. I instantly get up and begin to walk over over there. The light in the room was hovering, as if someone had a flashlight and was waving it around. I got about 10 feet from the door and shut it off, so I ran in there and there was nothing. I looked out the window to make sure no one was messing with me and called the other guard in the building, but he was on the fifth floor. Totally unexplainable. But the one thing that to this day gets me the most is something that I actually got proof of. Another night, me and another security guard were wrapping up a half night tour. Like the full night tour, but only 50 bucks and four hours. As we were walking on the second floor, the guard stopped me. We looked down the hallway and saw the interior slash exterior doors were wide open. These doors were installed after the current owners bought the place and they are big, heavy doors that lock and you can't unlock them from the outside without a key. Anyway, the other security guard swore up and down that he saw a tall dark figure walk out the door, but I didn't. After a little debate, we decided that maybe it was another security guard and we didn't want to lock him out, so we left the doors open. A few days pass, and while I'm there, I hear two other security guards talking about something they witnessed. When I spoke to them, they told me both the same story, how they both saw the tall, dark figure and went running after it. That's the moment when I suddenly realized that there was a motion detecting camera on the door, so I hit the computer to see what I could find. What I saw was crazy. The door that was shut, out of nowhere, just suddenly swings open by itself and there's no one around. Time code on the camera showed how the camera would kick on when it's motion detected. Like for a moth or other bug. The door swings open and no one was there. Four hours passed and the next thing on the camera was the guards running out the door. Scary place, man. I highly suggest visiting it if you get a chance. I work in a store in the mall in a fairly nice area. I work right by the main doorway, which people come in and out of all day, unsurprisingly, and people hang out in the vestibule area between the outside and inside doors waiting for the bus to come. I usually work alone at night, lock up and leave through the same area, walk to my car, and go home. Two days ago, I end up working a morning shift and get to leave at 4 p.m. while it's still light out. Mind you, I'm a 22-year-old slim blonde girl and usually get mistaken for a 13-year-old. This day, I was wearing a pink sweatshirt, pink leggings, and my hair was in a ponytail. So I guess people could mistake me as young. Otherwise, normal day, whatever. I'm walking towards the vestibule and when I push open the first set of doors, I always check if there's someone behind me to see if I should hold the door open for them because I don't want to seem rude. So I see an Asian guy, tan jacket, car keys, casually walking a good distance behind me. I don't want him to try and hurry up, so I hold the door open with my foot for him to walk through while I check my phone. He walks through the door, grabs my arm and says, come with me, I know what you stole. He's grabbing my arm pretty hard and is pulling me. Mind you, there are two women on the opposite side of the vestibule and a guy standing maybe three feet away. And I'm making eye contact directly with this guy with a please help me kind of look. The Asian guy continues saying, come with me. And is partway through the door to the outside. And I'm keeping my distance, trying to keep my arm close to my body and pull back. I think I mumbled something like, I don't want to. I was so confused and couldn't even comprehend what I was doing. I thought for a second, is he joking? Does he think I'm someone else or is he messing with me? Is he mentally ill? And if I pull back enough, is he gonna let go and casually walk out the door into his car and drive off? Me and the dude that were just standing there the whole time just had our jaws dropped looking at each other, just trying to communicate what the hell that was. He thought the same thing. He ended up walking me to my car, telling me that I needed to report it. 
I gave him a big hug and thanked him and got into my car, called my mum, then security, and talked to the security and the police and spoke to a detective the whole nine. Apparently this isn't the first time a tall Asian guy is acting weird. A guy, probably the same one, apparently harasses juvenile girls at the mall frequently and isn't even supposed to be there. Security showed me some pictures of an Asian guy that they suspected and caught the whole thing on camera. He apparently walked in only 15 minutes before this happened. I'm still kind of shaken. I'm putting in my two weeks on Monday. This happened when I was a nine year old lad at a church of all places, long before my drug problem ever started. So you guys can know for a fact I wasn't tripping. My church was having a summer camp type of thing for all the kids during the school holidays. My parents wanted me and my cousin who was 12 at the time out the house and sent us along. So there we were, a group of around 50 kids in this huge church with around five youth leaders. We were watching movies, playing games and whatever else. Things are good. One day everyone is outside playing some weird ball game. The sun is out and the day was good. I figured I'd go inside to grab my cap so that I wouldn't get a sunburn. Worst mistake ever. I go inside. Keep in mind it's a big church and my bag is right in the front. I see it and think, that's weird. Wasn't it more to the back where I was sitting? I say screw it and take a stroll to the front and open my bag looking around for my cap. When I hear someone whistle for me, I turn my attention behind me to the huge whiteboard that the projector hits and there he is, a man, skin as white as snow his ashy hair falling down from the sides of his fedora. He's dressed in a suit. He waves at me with cold eyes and a crooked smile. I drop to the floor, my body starts shaking uncontrollably and I don't know what to do. It feels like my heart's gonna burst. In comes my cousin with another girl who we became friends with. They're shaking me and I don't know what to do. They call in another lady, a youth leader, and they watch over me and I eventually stop. They pick me up and want to take me to hospital, but I tell them it's fine. I'd never had a seizure before and I didn't even get what the big deal was. They rush me outside and carry me through the crowd to a car and in the crowd, there he is, clear as day, tipping his hat before vanishing. They rush me outside and called my parents. I told them what happened and my parents were pale. I've had a history of experiences like this, you see. The pastor convinced them to let me stay. And apparently what I said to my parents before they left was, look at how they run around in the circle with the children, as I pointed to the kids playing. I still think about the white skinned man from time to time. Fun fact, when I was a baby, a random lady approached my parents and told them I was a special baby and walked away. Maybe that's why I see all the weird stuff. When I was in my early 20s, I was sitting alone at a near empty coffee shop when I spot a young woman about my age trying not to cry. So I went over and asked if I could sit with her. We spoke for hours about everything and nothing at the same time. She didn't go into details about what was going on with her, but she felt like there was no hope. I did my best to encourage her and told her not to give up tried to give her reasons to hold on, thought of ideas that may give her a spark of hope. The coffee shop was closing. I wrote my phone number down and told her that I would love to hang out with her again and that she could call me any time. She looked at me and told me that everything I said to her wasn't for her to hear, it was for me. I hadn't told her that I was in fact suicidal. I had originally gone to the coffee shop to think about how best to end my life. While talking to her, I figured if I could maybe help someone else not feel the way I do, I wouldn't do it, at least not yet. She not only saved my life that day, but gave my life a whole new purpose filled with hope. I'm a therapist now. I help people all day. She hugged me and then walked out the door. 
I ran after her because she forgot the napkin with my number on it. I was no more than two seconds behind her. I got outside, and there was no one there. This was around 2017 in Casablanca. My cousins, friends and I were going to a restaurant at night. We were five people, so we had to take two cabs. My cousin, our friend and I took the first taxi. We were minors at the time, and it was my first time taking a taxi without an adult. The driver seemed a bit weird at first. His eyes were reddish, and he looked like he was on something. We could just tell by the way he was speaking. He started driving and was making inappropriate comments. I can't remember specifically because it was a while ago, but it certainly made us all uncomfortable. We were at a stoplight and he suddenly locked the doors and said, I'll choose one of you lot and I'll take her back with me. He then looked at my cousin who was next to him and then looked at us in the back and said, I'll take her, while pointing at my cousin and smiling. At that point, I felt my blood pressure drop and the thing is, none of us had cell phone credit or data. He just started asking questions and somehow talked about football, and my cousin tried to engage conversation with him to lighten the atmosphere. He started telling us that he was a football coach for girls and started saying stuff about the girls and showing us their pictures. I was looking around, and I saw he was taking the right route, and we were near the restaurant. We asked him to stop, but he blanked us, so we repeated it, and he was like, chill girls, I'm gonna stop. And I was joking earlier. We got off and were shocked and relieved at the same time that nothing happened. But now I have this fear of taking a taxi by myself without an adult. It was a rainy, drizzly day on a Sunday in April. Me and my guy friend had planned to hang out the day before. We were both the age of 14. I left my house at 10 in the morning because we'd planned to get breakfast and met on our bikes around the corner of a street near my house. And then we left the neighborhood to a different town. I knew my mother probably wouldn't have wanted me to go, but we headed off on our bikes anyway. It took us an hour to get three towns over. We got food at some cafe and ended up in a sketchy neighborhood. And we rode our bikes looking for something to do until we stumbled upon an abandoned house. We parked our bikes on the side of the house behind a large bush so no one would see them and we looked around. It looked pretty broken down and had a creepy look to it. The house had a fair amount of caution and do not enter signs on it, which was enough of a warning for us, but we didn't listen. We ended up trespassing and breaking into the house through a back door that was open. I didn't want to because I was a bit of a scaredy cat and wasn't really into taking risks. I believed we would have gotten into trouble, but we never did, and he forced me to go in. There was a small broken wooden fence that you had to climb over before you were standing on the actual porch where the back door of the house was. The fence was broken with pieces of wood and glass sticking out, so you had to be careful climbing over it. The house smelt of rotten eggs and mold. I had a pit of guilt and fear in my stomach. I was scared out of my mind and jumped at every little creak and noise that came from the inside of the broken down old house. We looked for anything valuable on the first floor of the house, but there wasn't much. We stumbled up the creaky old staircase that led us to the second floor. I had no intention of following my friend up there though. He went up by himself and I waited at the bottom. He finally convinced me after much pleading to ascend. So begrudgingly I did. We didn't really find anything that valuable except for some fake jewelry and old pictures of the previous family members who once occupied the abode. And after raiding anything we could, we went back down the stairs. And here's the scary part. We found ourselves searching the bottom half of the house. After finding a few secret rooms we hadn't seen before, I suggested countless times that we should leave before someone found us or that we got hurt by something. But my friend replied with, just give me a minute and we'll leave, which we never did. We stopped dead in our tracks when we heard faint footsteps coming from the upstairs right above where we were standing and we made eye contact with each other. We were both terrified. 
After a few seconds, we heard a door slam from upstairs, and we bolted for the back door as quick as we could and slammed it shut behind us. My friend had quickly hopped over the broken fence onto the back porch. He was taller than me, so it was easier for him, but for me, being a much shorter girl, it wasn't easy. I ended up hopping over as fast as I could. Before my other leg was over the fence, I felt something cold brush past my ankle, but I didn't look back. I threw myself over the fence, twisted my ankle, and got a small cut on my leg. I limped to the bikes that were behind the bush where we'd left them, and we went off. We both headed straight home after that, and decided not to talk about what we saw. When I got home, I noticed that I had a bruise where I had felt that cold breeze as I was leaving the house. And I will never sneak into anywhere abandoned again. This happened three years ago when I was in scout camp. I was part of older scouts, so we were the ones entrusted to guard the camp at night. Every day a patrol is chosen, and they need to guard the camp with two people guarding it for two hours, then shift roles and pass it on to someone else in our year group. That night it was our patrol to do the job. Since there were five of us, I didn't have a partner, but a guy called Nick volunteered to join me. Nick was from another patrol, but he was the cool guy, you know, handsome, funny, strong, and I was happy because we didn't know each other well. And at this point was the occasion to get to know each other a little bit better. And he was strong, so I wasn't scared of guarding at night. In the night, one of us would go look around the camp while the other guarded the campfire. I heard some weird noises that night, but it's a forest, so I didn't really think about it. After that, I told him the first episode of Stranger Things to scare him and it worked. When there were just 20 minutes left, we decided to go together to look around, quickly finish the job and go back to sleep. After a few minutes around the camp, we arrived at the quarter of the young wolves, who were the junior scouts, in which my sister was a part of. I started to walk in their quarters, reaching the wooden gate they built, but when I crossed the gate, I stopped moving. I don't know how to explain this, but you know when a weirdo on the street comes towards you with a knife, and all your senses are telling you to get away from danger. Now, I had just been hit with the same feeling, but ten times worse. All my senses were shouting, danger, get out, as I felt a fear so strong, I was petrified for a moment. I felt a presence. I don't know what, but I felt something in the dark. I couldn't see anything in the darkness, but I was sure that there was something out there, something really dangerous. I was just standing there for what seemed like years, but suddenly, Nick grabbed my shoulder. He was pale, sweating, and scared to death. That was when I realized that he experienced something too. I never saw him like this before. This strong guy, so sure of himself, whose everyone's friend was scared, like a child, and I was too. For a long time, we both just looked at each other, and then he said to get out of here. We went back to camp and didn't talk to each other. Two days later in the morning, when there was a flag lifting ceremony, Nick and I noticed that a girl was missing from one of the patrols. When the ceremony ended, we asked the girls why their patrol is incomplete, and they replied, Katie passed out last night when she guarded the camp with Lily. We were both shaken and I asked, why, what happened? The girl named Lily replied, we split up. I went to go to the plain side and she went deep into the woods to the wolf's quarters and I heard her scream, ran back and saw her passed out on the ground in front of the gate. We looked at each other with Nick and we knew what the other was thinking. We go talk to the girl in her tent and asked her what happened. She was really uneasy and wanted us to go away but I asked her, what she felt. That's when her facial expression changed. She was scared. She said, I, I don't, it was horrible. We patiently listened to her for a while as she tried to find the correct words to express herself. I don't know what it was, but I never want to experience it again. She was shaking like a leaf. Many days passed and at the end of camp, roughly the 11th day, we packed up our tents, 
to sleep one last night under the stars near the campfire, but our patrol had a chill zone where we slept away from the camp. The camp was near the Danube, and our tent was just next to the little entrenchment of the river. There was an old chair buried half in the sand, probably a fishing spot for someone, and it looked so chill sitting down and looking over the water flow that it gave us an idea. We didn't move the chair, as it was like a part of the river, and near it we set up four hammocks in place and just chilled there every time we had a chance. So the last day we decided to sleep in there. I didn't bring myself a hammock because I can't sleep in one, it's too uncomfortable for me. So I slept on the ground between the hammocks of my friends forming a pentagonal shape. They fell asleep quite quickly, while I was awake and listening to the flow of the river and slowly fell asleep while my eyes were looking at the chair near from us. I opened my eyes. The sun had started to rise and the environment wasn't that dark anymore. But when I started to see clearly and looked around, my heart stopped for a moment. I saw a shadowy figure sitting on the chair. I watched him for I don't know how long, but at some point he turned around and noticed me. I was alone, scared, and didn't know what to do. The figure stood up, stared at me with white, empty glowing eyes, took a step, then a few more. And as he did, it felt like my heart was going to jump out my chest. I looked around to see where my friends were sleeping and thought it was probably just a dream. It was morning after all. I stood up, packed up, but noticed something. The chair was somehow out of the sand, and there were fresh footprints next to it. Two fresh footprints. As if someone had just stood up from the chair. It was St. Patrick's Day in Boston, circa 2017 and a few of my friends and I decided to go to this pub in South Boston. We'd been drinking all day and hadn't eaten much when we showed up at the pub. The place was packed and the line to get in was egregious. My friend Pat and I decided to cross the street to grab a couple of slices of pizza at this hole in the wall while the rest of our friends hold our spot in line to get into the pub. Here is where things get weird. We order a few slices and sit down. As we're waiting, this really old man wearing all different shades of green carrying a gnarled wooden cane showed up. He had no hair, was wrinkled beyond belief, and smiled at us with a mouth of about six teeth and began to speak. Do you lads mind if I sit here for a wee bit of time? I just need to rest me old legs. My friends and I looked at each other and shrug. We figured it was just a homeless guy and to tell you the truth, we didn't think anything of the thick Irish accent. The old guy sits down and starts to crack out some truly crass jokes, wheezing and laughing after each one, cackling and cackling. We had gotten our food and had almost finished eating it when he asked us where we were from. We told him and he asked if we were Irish at all. We told him we were and where our families had originated from in Ireland. He seemed to really enjoy the fact that we were both of Irish descent. He then stood up, took his walking stick, tapped the table twice loudly and grinned. He then said, Not that you're gonna need it, good Irish lads like you, but I wish you both a good crake, good luck and good night. Right at that point, my phone, which was sitting on the table to my right, started ringing. Our friend called us to tell us that they were getting close to the front of the line and to get our butts back across the street. Both Pat and I glanced at our phones ringing, and we then said goodbye to the old man. But he was gone, literally vanished without a sound. There was a bell on the door to the pizza place that would have dung every time someone opened it, and neither of us heard the bell chime. He was simply gone. Later in the night, I was stepping out onto a street at an intersection, not really paying attention to traffic. A car was pulling away from the curb behind us and started blasting shipping up to Boston by the Dropkick Murphys. As I heard it, I stopped and turned back to say to my friend, I love this song. Right as I stopped, a taxi screamed past me on the street. I missed getting hit by that car by less than a foot, and it would have put me in the hospital 
if it hadn't have straight up killed me. My friend Pat and I swear that the old guy in the pizza shop gave us some magic good luck charm or something. And it was that random car blasting music that saved my life that night. I know it sounds crazy, but we're certain that the old man in the pizza shop was an actual leprechaun. A few years ago, I worked at a grocery store as the manager for the online shopping department. I didn't have a car at the time, so I would take Ubers to work occasionally. The night before this incident, I was at the local brewery with my friends. I took an Uber home then thought the driver was kind of off because of how inquisitive he was, but played it off as him just making small talk. The next morning, I requested an Uber, and it was the same guy. No big deal. It happened all the time here because I lived in such a small town. So I got in the car and this guy remembered everything about me. But again, played it off because I'd literally seen him 12 hours before. I was definitely getting creeped out though. We started chatting again and he was telling me about how he and his wife are having problems. I thought it was weird as hell, but figured maybe he just wanted to talk about it because that's my personality. Then he started talking about how they used to ride four wheelers together and says how he misses it. I stupidly say, I've always wanted to ride one. Are they fun? Oh, they're great, he says. You should definitely ride some. I actually have a few. I got sketched out and was like, oh, cool. I should see if my boyfriend would be down to ride them too. Finally, we got to work. He gave me an awkwardly long goodbye speech and thanked me for using Uber. And about an hour later, my co-worker and I heard knocking at the door that leads to the pickup space. And it was the Uber driver. I awkwardly opened the door and my co-worker that I call Steve luckily came up behind me because I was like, what the hell? And the driver asked me to exchange numbers with him because he wanted to take me for a ride. Luckily, Steve was like, dude, I'm her boyfriend. What the hell, man? And we closed the door. Steve was an absolute champ. He didn't leave. We had to page my boss, and then he called the cops because he wouldn't go. And he ran off, finally, when the cops showed up. It was super creepy. I contacted Uber, got a refund, and also got a pretty strong confirmation that he no longer worked for them. Yikes. A few weeks ago, I was in Walmart with my gran. We were walking around and shopping for stuff, your normal Saturday morning errand run. While walking around, I had begun to notice an older man in his late 30s slash early 40s kind of scruffy clothing that looked like he'd been working in a few of the same aisles as my gran. I thought nothing of it since it's Walmart and it's not that big of a store. At one point, my grandma asks me if I need any new bras. For those of you who don't know, Walmart sells $3.98 bras and they're awesome. I told her, yeah, sure, and we went to the ladies' underwear section of the store. My grandma went to look at bras, and I went to see if they had any matching underwear when I noticed the man again. I walked down to the sock aisle and didn't see him, so I slowly made my way back to where the thongs and stuff were. I was minding my own business when I heard someone walk behind me. I figured it was my gram, so I partially turned to ask how many pairs I could get, but she wasn't behind me. I looked around and see the guy at the end of the aisle. Whatever, maybe he has a wife or girlfriend. And I went back into my little world looking for underwear. I looked for another minute or so when I felt a presence behind me. I looked to my left and saw a little bit of my grandma who was obscured by the rack looking at nightgowns. I decided to stare straight ahead since maybe someone taller than me was just looking at underwear that was over my head and felt some kind of press against me. Then I heard breathing. It was heavy pleasure breathing, like someone was just calming down after finishing. I turned on my heels to see this guy who had been following me with his hands down his pants, obviously fondling himself. I literally screamed nanny and the guy sprinted away. I told Walmart security and they told me they had no authority to do anything about it. I just can't get that sound of his breathing out of my head. In college, a group of friends and I would research haunted slash creepy abandoned places and drive out to explore them. We'd often get places from websites, books, hearsay, basically any way we could back then. 
So it's safe to say that a decent portion of our leads were probably bull or made up. Regardless of that, we explored our fair share of abandoned houses, mental facilities and haunted areas. Realistically, the biggest danger we ever encountered would have been an angry squatter, but you never know. We did hear a woman screaming for help and what sounded like a gunshot in an abandoned mental facility, but after exploring extensively and finding nothing, someone was just probably messing with us. One time was different though. We'd gotten a lead about a small lake in the middle of some woods where a large stone was used for rituals. We figured it was probably all BS, but it was close to a good diner and we figured at worst we'd get a good omelet out of the trip. We got to the forest about dusk and parked the car and headed into the woods. There was a faint footpath that you could tell was used with irregularity. We pressed onwards and knew that we were strapped for time as we didn't bring any flashlights with us, as we planned to get there much earlier in the day than we did. The forest canopy was making it much darker than it actually was, and we ran into the small lake which we were reading about, but didn't see any large stone or something that might be a centerpiece for the rituals we'd read about. The footpath went deeper into the forest, and we decided to follow it for five more minutes before turning back. The path slowly began to ascend a small hill and in the distance, we could make out some dark blobs that appeared to be hovering in a slight haze. Again, it was quite dark at this point, so it was hard to make out exactly what we were seeing. As we approached slowly, we realized the haze was actually a tall chain link fence. That's not the creepy part though. The part that unnerved us was that the dark blobs were every 10 feet on the fence. There was a dead and decaying dog strung up attached by a dead snake wrapped around the dog's neck and through the chain links. The fence was padlocked with a chain, but not very tall. We could have jumped it, but it was dark and we didn't have flashlights. It was on the top of a hill and we weren't able to make out what was inside the fenced off area as it turned into a fairly steep decline. We let fear get the better of us and ran all the way back to the car, sitting in silence the entire drive home. I've always meant to go back to that place, even years later now, but I had such a feeling of sickness and dread that I simply can't bring myself to. It's almost an unspoken rule that none of us even bring the place up with one another. This happened to me a while back, when I was forced to go to summer camp. I say summer camp, it was more like Bible summer camp, so all the fun of summer camp with a good old Bible seminar thrown in every day for a few hours. That was fun, as you can imagine. So being the angsty moody teen I was, I dug my heels in and refused to go, but ended up going anyway. I instantly hated the place, not because of anything that had happened or anything. I just really didn't want to be there and made my attitude known to each and every person I interacted with whether it be a fellow campee or even any of the adults that were chaperoning us or our Bible tutors and such. Each and every one of them knew that I didn't want to be there, but they did their best to try and be accommodating for my poor behavior, shall we call it. In order to rebel, as I really didn't want to be there, aside from being moody, one of the things I liked to do was after hours when everyone was told to go to sleep, I would pull down the window as my bunk was next to the window. I didn't even care if the fellow girls heard me leave because I honestly didn't think they would tattle on me. I'd jump out as it was a cabin and go for a walk in the darkness. On our first day, we had been given a little tour of the area and I found a nice little space where it was fairly dark where I could just chill by myself and do nothing in particular. Just stare out into the darkness of the woods or maybe look over the lake, perhaps look up at the stars as this was one of those rare places where light pollution wasn't so much of a hindering factor here and you could see up and see actual stars, which was probably the only part of the camp I actually enjoyed. I, for a few days, I would make my way there and enjoy a little nighttime stroll and me time. After a little while, I'd realize it would be late, 
my eyelids would start to droop and it would be a little bit too warm. So I'd make my way back to the room, hop through the window, close the window a bit more quieter this time and get back into bed and make out like nothing had happened. On the third night, just as I was leaving, I heard some of the group leaders chatting amongst themselves. They were standing outside one of the little cabins and I had to hide. I got bored of hiding during their conversation as I think they were flirting and didn't seem to be going anywhere. So I slowly made my way back a different way, intent on finding somewhere else to hide and chill for my nightly stroll. Today, I was feeling particularly salty. I was starting to warm up to camp just a tad. However, one of the other girls had pushed me by accident, you know, while playing a game of dodgeball. She was on my team. In any case, that had really got me into a bad mood and I seriously didn't want any human interaction for the rest of the day. As I was walking towards nowhere in particular, did I hear some rustling behind me? Instantly I froze. I was more worried about getting in trouble than anything else. But if it came to it, whatever, maybe I'd get sent home early. So even though fear overtook me initially, I started to turn around, but then there was no one there. I was certain that I had heard the rustling, positive in fact, and I didn't let this dissuade me. So I squinted into the darkness to see if I could make out any shape or figure. Maybe they were gonna jump out on me and pretend to scare me. That was pissing me off, that thought alone. And so I waited for a few moments. And when I saw absolutely nothing still, did I convince myself it must have just been an animal that has by this point left the vicinity. My walk continues. And as I'm approaching a different part of the lake, do I slow down near a tree that I saw earlier and sit and relax? Just thinking of all the horrible things I'd like to do to the girl that pushed me over in my rage and pent up anger. I'm sitting there and just quietly imagining these blissful thoughts when I hear the distinct sound of footsteps behind me once more. At this point, I don't turn around. I'm just listening, scared. I wasn't sure if they'd be able to see me because I was sitting right by a very large tree. It should have shielded me from most angles unless you were looking from the lake, of course, where I was clearly visible. I listened, still and motionless in the darkness, waiting to see if someone was gonna spring up on me or not. I didn't hear a voice. I didn't hear a call just footsteps inching ever closer. I closed my eyes, put my hands in front of them and pretended like I wasn't there. That's when I heard it. I'm sure she went this way. Nah, mate, I saw her running the other way. It was two men, two men's voices that I'd never heard. The majority of the people working here who were part of the church and the group and stuff were people that I had known, at least peripherally, for a part of my life. Or at least, you know, seen in the last three days. This voice, this guy, wasn't part of the group, nor was his friend. I sat there stock still, but now a wave of fear washed over me like one I'd never felt before. Cold sweat was forming down my back and I felt the hairs on the back of my head and on my arms stand on end, fully alert. I knew I could not run those men, and was thinking that perhaps if I angle myself just right, maybe I could make a running jump for the lake and swim to, well, who knows where. I wasn't thinking straight. I was just terrified, shaking, and I ended up having to put my hand up to my mouth so that they wouldn't hear me. They carried on talking, discussing which way I might have gone. One of them was shining a flashlight. I saw him from the side approaching the river, and at this point I almost pooped my pants. I was sure he was gonna see me. He was gonna move his flashlight over to me any second, 
and see my silhouette in the dark come running over and then God knows what was going to happen to me. But by some kind of miracle, something happened. The other guy who'd gone far to the right shouted that he saw movement and the guy with the flashlight came running. He decided to run along the beach and he was running in a straight line in a trajectory going ahead. The miracle is that he completely didn't see me. There was one moment where his flashlight in his left hand grazed and illuminated my entire body. The fortunate part being that as he ran, it must have been on the backswing of his hand and I just missed his peripheral vision. I doubt the other guy was looking. When the flashlight left my body and I saw him run for a second or two, did I instantly slowly skulk out from my hiding spot and as quietly as possible walk back the way to camp. I was feeling very scared. I wanted to talk to one of the counsellors but knew I'd be in trouble for doing what I had just done. So instead, I retreated back into my bed and pretended like it never happened. I knew it was stupid of me to go out at night. I didn't realise those guys were following me at all. I only heard them the one time. I really wonder what could have happened to me had I not heard them and hidden. It would have been much simpler to just not go out at all. We moved into a new apartment complex last year and I'm positive one of our neighbouring couples are aliens. Let me give you some context. Both seem to be in their 40s. The husband is nice but seems very fake nice. Not like snobby or anything but genuinely trying to put on a show. And when I say hi to him, he always slowly raises his hand, stares and then after a few moments gives me a very weird hi there. He is also constantly working outside of his garage area, like on man stuff, but none of his projects or purchases ever see the light of day. It's all like it's a show. The wife is even more bizarre. Unlike her husband, any time I say hi to her, she stares at me and kind of follows me with her eye but doesn't say a word. She'll stand in the apartment entrance and if I pull my car in, she stares and doesn't move until my car is weirdly close to her. The wife's weirdest trait though is yet to come. I have never seen her wear shoes, but I've never seen her bare feet either. She wears socks all year round. I have on two occasions caught her outside in the pouring rain doing things with only socks on her feet, taking walks with socks, playing with her kids in only socks. I swear everything this couple does seems straight out of a Men in Black movie. I work a long commute away from home and depend on the train. There were some issues that caused the trains to be cancelled for hours, which left me stranded about an hour and a half away from home. At the train station, there were a few others who were all heading to my city and we decided to split a taxi. The people were woman one, Lisa, heading to my city to see a gig. She was a bit tipsy. A guy called Kyle travelling with Lisa. They're not dating, but their conversation seemed to make out that they were very good friends. He was beyond drunk, and it made me a bit uncomfortable because he was pissing in a bush and kept making vulgar comments about Lisa's hot cousin. Then this other dude, John. He was travelling alone and mentioned that he lived in my city, just moved there, but was in the town we were leaving from as he just broke up with his girlfriend and was picking up stuff from her place. And another woman who I'll talk about later. This other woman decided to stay at her mother's house in the town for another evening, so drops out of the taxi ride. That should have been my cue to also drop out, but they had just rung the taxi and I didn't want to ruin it as they already calculated how much we each needed to pay. I decided to ask Lisa if she could sit next to me and she said she understood completely and said that she would sit in the middle. So the seating arrangement was drunk Kyle sat at the front, me on one side, Lisa in the middle, 
and John as well. Mind, from where we were parked, there was no danger to getting in from the other side, as there were no oncoming cars. He opened the door on my side and just stared at me. Then Lisa says cheerfully for me to sit on the other side, as she wanted the middle seat to talk to Carl more easily. John stared at us for a second time, then scoffed and slowly walked over to the other side and got in. The ride itself was awkward, as Lisa and Kyle were both drunk and dirty laundry was aired. That's how I gathered that they were sleeping together. Lisa was drinking still before she finally said she needed to go to the toilet and was desperate. The taxi man found a public leisure center for him to pull into. She got out and went inside. Mistake number two. I should have gone with her. I just didn't think about it. Normally I go with female friends in restaurants or bars, but because it was in a taxi and freezing outside, I just stayed. Kyle and John went out to smoke a cigarette. Then John came back when he saw Lisa coming out. He scooted over to the middle and put his hand on my upper thigh and rested it there. Regret number three. I should have said something and made a scene, but I just froze completely. Lisa opened the door, looked at John, looked at me, then looked at John's hand on my thigh, about two inches away from my lady parts. She cheerfully said to him, Oh, I'm so sorry. Can we switch places? I love sitting in the middle. John looked pissed. He looked over at me, who was still frozen, removed his hand from my thigh and scooted out to make room for her. He grumbled something I couldn't hear before Lisa said, Thank you, and came in next to me. John sat in his allocated seat this time and we took off. Lisa then took my hand and whispered, Woman to woman, I'll make sure you get home safe. I was just tearing up and said thank you. Then throughout the journey, about four to five times after Lisa had leaned forward to speak to Kyle, John slipped his hand to her seat, so when she would sit back down, he would touch her ass. Every time she just giggled and said, Oh, sorry, I think I sat on your hand. I felt awful because she was in this position because of me. So I apologized and she just repeated that she'll get me home safely. She was very drunk at this point from the extra taxi drinking. So I think she just latched onto that mission. When we got close to the city center, Lisa asked me where I needed to get to. And I told her the general area. John said he moved into an area that is literally in the opposite direction. His suburb is north and I'm south of the city center. He said after Carl and Lisa got out that we would share a taxi. Despite that making no sense, as we lived in completely different directions from each other. I said, no, that's fine. But he was insistent and wouldn't take no for an answer. Lisa was too drunk and crying about how much she loves her dog at this point to protect me. And I texted my husband that I was terrified and if he could walk up to come get me. My husband booked it over there as fast as he could. And after we got out the taxi, John was getting his bags out the trunk and I said bye to Lisa and just ran as fast as I could to make it to my husband. We say it all the time, but it needs to be said again. Screw being polite when you feel scared. John probably latched onto me because I was traveling alone, or Lisa was with a man. Lisa is right. Girls need to stick together. I should have gone with her to the toilet. About six years ago, my mum and I went to Walmart to get her meds. She gets home from work late, so we go over to Walmart at around seven. The parking lot is horribly underlit, as is the entrance to the store. As we're walking towards the entrance, a man walks towards me and pauses like he's going to start a conversation with me. He's wearing a cap, cargo shorts and sneakers. I can't really make out any details of his face, but I'm fairly sure I didn't know him. My mum and I walk in and go to the pharmacy counter, which is right in the front of the store. I can now clearly see the guy. He looks to be in his late twenties slash early thirties. He's very dirty and his eyes are very sunken in. He keeps staring at me and walking around where we are. As my mum is speaking with the pharmacist, I notice another man start walking with the first. This man is very heavy set with dark hair and glasses and is far dirtier than the other man. The pharmacist needs a few more minutes to fill in the last script. So we sit and wait. I tell my mum about the men. 
and she tells me to stay near her. The guy is in the cab, mumbling loudly to himself, and keeps pacing behind me. I ask my mum for the truck key so that I can wait outside for her. She says that being a little 17-year-old girl in a dark parking lot is a bad idea, even without two people following her. She sees that I'm uncomfortable and on the verge of tears, so she gets up and goes to talk to them. I'm her only child, so of course she's very protective of me. She walks over to the men, speaks to them for about two minutes, and they're far enough away that I can't hear what they're saying, but I can see how uncomfortable the men look. As my mum walks back to me, the men leave the store. I ask her what she said, and she just replied that she took care of it. 15 years ago, I was in the Air Force and got assigned to provide mobile security to missiles launch facilities located in Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska. Riding around in a Humvee for 12 hours a day, four days a week in the middle of nowhere is pretty boring. So we would often go into the many abandoned houses located within our patrol area. One was unlike the rest. It was a red brick ranch style house that looked like it was built in the 70s and was in decent condition on the outside for it just to be sitting there with no one living in it. I passed the place every day, so I was pretty confident it was abandoned, but I still waited a few months before going in. One night my curiosity got the best of me, so I decided to stop by and check the place out with my team. It was 1am, so we had to use our mag lights to light our way. We never went into places that were locked, so I was excited to see the back door was wide open and the front unlocked. We also looked in the windows before entering to ensure the place was indeed vacant, since we had to carry our weapons in with us. Upon entering, it was a normal abandoned place, stuff scattered everywhere and dusty as hell. We explore around and find out the place has a basement, open the door and slowly make our way down into the abyss, shining our lights around and something catches the eye of one of the guys. He points his light at it, freaking out. It's a human figure standing there with their back towards us wearing a cowboy hat. There's no movement. And then I notice that this person isn't touching the ground. So I point my light up there to see a rope is around their neck and they're hanging by the rafters. We start freaking out, wondering what the hell to do as we get closer to ensure that it is indeed what we think it is before alerting the authorities, I get within range to knock its hat off with my M4 and meet a burlap sack. Someone thought it would be funny to hang a scarecrow from the rafters, and it did a bloody good job at making us all crap our pants. I used to work tables in a restaurant one day this guy I've never interacted with before comes to me and hands me a framed picture smiling nervously. I took it. It's a picture of me at the staff table. I was done eating and staring at nothing, probably thinking about something deep and clever. I looked at the guy and he explains timidly that he found me so pretty that he took a picture and framed it so that I could see how pretty I was and to hold on to it forever. Sweet gesture, but kind of creepy. Five seconds later, the manager walks by, hears the story, bursts out laughing and decide this is perfect and hangs up the frame in the back on the wall next to the work schedules in a place where everyone that works here looks at practically every day. He thought it was hilarious. Everyone had a laugh then we kind of forgot about it. The picture became part of the wall. It's been eight years since I've worked there. The staff changed, the managers changed over the years. Everyone I knew changed jobs and everything. But my best work friend still remains. You know, the one person that could probably do another job better for her, but stays in this place out of pure habit, really. The one person that will always be there and still work there, probably 20 years after you moved on. She decided to keep the picture she told the new managers that the girl on the wall was a waitress that worked here and died in an accident and that the whole staff decided to frame her picture and honor her or whatever to keep her memory alive because she loved this place so much. You know, you get it. Well, eight years later, when I occasionally visit the restaurant to say hello to my friend, 
I have a quick glance above the schedules, and the picture is still there. I wonder if the workers see me and do a double take that the ghost girl has come back to the restaurant. This happened to me and my friend when we were 15. I can still remember it clearly, and I didn't dream it, as I wrote it down in my diary. Me and my friend were at Bible camp. Well, when I say Bible camp, it was just a bunch of hipsters singing acoustic songs about Jesus and rock climbing and canoeing for a week. So, you know, nothing overtly religious, really. Like I said, we couldn't sleep. It was midnight and everyone was sent to bed at 10, so we decided to head out the cabin and head to this lake. It was all on the campsite, and we knew the way from orienteering that day. The dirt paths and the whole trail were lit up, and it was actually so beautiful. Anyway, we got to this lake, and we live in the UK, so we don't have to worry about alligators or anything, and went skinny dipping. We got changed and decided to head back. We were walking back when we noticed a tree with the word done carved on it. We thought it was something to do with the orienteering trail, so we walked back more into the trees at the side of the path, and then we heard a branch snap above us, and something heavy fell on top of us. It was furry, and I swore it was a large animal, but whatever it was wasn't alive. We bolted before we could even inspect it. I bolted back to our cabin. We checked our clothes to see if there were any clues as to what it could be, but there was nothing. The next day canoeing was cancelled, and the whole lake was then blocked off. We asked our team leader, and she said that the water needed to be cleaned even though it's a lake. And then we asked the guy that ran the canoeing, and he said that the lifeguard was sick and couldn't guard. I don't know what really happened. I'm convinced that it's a cover-up. I used to live in a very old house in the hills of Western Maryland. It only had windows in the front and back of the house, not on the sides, and when I asked, it was explained that the houses were built this way back then, so the slaves walking between the houses couldn't look in. We were renting from a friend of the family who owned the place, and before we moved in, we were warned that the house was special, and that we should be prepared for that. However, no explanation was ever offered as to what special meant. I came to find out that the house was, well, I won't say haunted, more like enchanted. Weird things happened there a lot. The weirdest by far happened a few months before I moved away. Across the street was an open field that quickly turned into foothills, and maybe 300 yards further on became a tall ridge of mountain. There was some kind of antenna on the top of the ridge, and it had a light that was always on at night. No blinking just a steady white light all the time. One evening I went out to use the bathroom, as it had an outhouse, and happened to notice that the light on the ridge was off. I walked down the driveway a bit because I thought there may have been a tree blocking it from the angle or something, but I stopped dead in my tracks. Suddenly the entire sky behind the ridge lit up, like someone had turned on an extremely bright floodlight and they were reflecting off the snow to an overcast sky or something. But there was no snow on the ground and it wasn't even slightly overcast. It was eerily quiet, even more than usual. Now I was really damn curious, so I continued walking down the driveway to see if I could get a better angle on it, only to see a guy come around the curve of the street and from the left and approach me at a quick walk. This is a fairly remote neighborhood. There are only two other inhabited houses on the street we hardly ever see traffic, much less foot traffic, so this was unexpected. As he got close, he said, You don't want to go over there. It was a cautioning tone. Well, it's not like I was going to climb the mountain in the dark, but why? What's going on? I asked, trying to keep it conversational. Couldn't say, he said, but you don't want to be a part of it. Well, if you don't know what's going on, how do you know I don't want to be a part of it? I asked. That's pretty weird. I gestured in the direction of the ridge and noticed the light was fluctuating a bit, like a slow pulsing. No, that's weird as hell, and <laughs> I'm a curious person. The guy then shifted to a darker, more ominous tone and said, Your eyes are not meant to see. The way he said it made me think you're meant human, 
and in retrospect it was definitely a warning, maybe even a threat, and sounded almost kind of like a ritual pronouncement. But I was oblivious in the moment. I looked back up to the light and said, well, I can see it fine. What's the problem? But then when I looked back down, the guy was gone. In the space of maybe five seconds, I was looking away, he had vanished. Please understand. There is no direction he could have gone, no matter how fast he was running, that could have gotten out of the line of sight at the time. I was already kind of freaked out by the weird lights, but this really pegged my fear out meter. I went back inside and explained to my roommate what I'd just seen, encouraged him to come out and see for himself. But by the time we got outside, whatever was going on behind the ridge was over. I figured this guy was just off his rocker and must have been something entirely normal going on over there. So I went online and looked at Google Maps for the area. There's nothing on the other side of the ridge. No roads, no buildings, no signs of civilization whatsoever. Just a blank spot on the map. I switched to satellite view and saw nothing but more wooded ridge lines behind it. To this day, I have no idea what the hell is going on or why I was warned away from it. But it feels like I had been sent some kind of messenger to help keep me from blundering into something terrible. It was 2006 and I was 17. I was dating a boy a few years older in the neighboring town from mine. My parents were not too keen on the fact I was dating an older guy, so they were not trying to give me rides over to his house or anything. His car was broken down at the time and I didn't have a car, so I was on my own. Sometimes if I was feeling energetic, I'd walk to his house after school. It was about a 45 minute walk, which sucked, but I did it sometimes. When either of us had a few extra dollars, I would take a cab. I was a nervous person, always taught about stranger danger, and I'm really good at reading people with bad vibes. I called my boyfriend who called me a cab and would pay for it when I got there. The guy picked me up and started making his way to my boyfriend's house. He was a younger guy, but older than my boyfriend and I, maybe around 25. Right away, I got sketched out by the way he looked at me, staring at me up and down and insisted I sit in the front seat. He said his back seat was pretty messy and liked to chat. Red flag number one, it's a cab. Why is your back seat messy? I was getting serious bad vibes. I got in the front and thought a quick 10 minute cab ride will be over soon. I messaged him to tell him I was in the cab and that I would be there at 10 minutes. The driver just starts talking, asking me questions about my life and whatnot. I don't remember the exact details, but I do remember telling him that I would be going to my boyfriend's house, but he had to get another person and drop them off first. I was like, what? And alarm bells were going off in my head. I was thinking that this is not what normally happens, but he is a guy who worked for a legit cab company, meaning his job knew where he was, so he couldn't do anything, right? He got on the walkie and lied to the cab company saying he didn't pick me up yet and was going to another fair closer by first. I planned on jumping out the cab and running if you tried anything. Well, he ended up picking up the other person, an old man in the same direction of my boyfriend's house. He didn't mention his messy back seat to the guy. The customer was talking and like, oh, so you're bringing your girlfriend to work? And the driver didn't even correct him and just say, no, she's a customer. So I knew something was wrong and messaged my boyfriend on the sneak. He called me and asked to talk to the driver. I don't know what he said, but he was obviously pissed off and the driver hung up. He was like, why'd you call him? I'm not a creep. I just wanted you to help me with my route. He handed me a stack of papers, asking if I could help him pick up another customer and he would drop me off at the end. I told him I needed to get to my boyfriend's now. I don't know how, but he ended up dropping me off and peeling away before my boyfriend could get his hands on him. I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't have a boyfriend who was angry on the phone and shook him. That's the most I remember. I'm sure there are details that I missed, but we did call the cab company and file a complaint. I'm not sure whatever came of it. I never took another cab for a long time. And now to this day, I always get nervous if I have to take an Uber home and stay on the phone 
while sharing my location at all times. Thanks for running camps for me. There was this kid I used to hang out with when I was around eight, and it still obsesses me. He wasn't from my school, and neither was he in the only other school in town. One day he just showed up at the end of school and played with my friends and I like kids do. He was really nice, polite, clean, and just seemed to have no family. He would never talk about his parents and avoid conversations about family. There was some sort of orphanage nearby, but friends who lived there said that he didn't live with them. He was weird, but in a weird way. He was nice and fun, yet really mature for an eight-year-old. He had this emotional intelligence. He understood people, talked very well about others' feelings, but barely showed his. He had this strange aura. He would start really deep conversations that were oddly deep for kids our age and had a really smooth voice at an age when most kids have the voice that tempts adults to put them on mute. One day, one of my friends lost his grandma and he found oddly accurate words to reassure him. That scene is still in my head to this day. On the other hand, he knew no cultural stuff. Every film, cartoon, comic, TV show, he wouldn't know. We showed him stuff like WWE, Dragon Ball, and other manga anime, and he became really fan. The only times he would act childish was when we wanted to know more about his life. He would answer funny and barely comprehensive things, like some kids do. Today, I'm 100% sure he did it on purpose. I really looked up to him, although he was no leader or whatever. He was weird in a cool way, or cool in a weird way, at an age when weird kid is just weird kid and no one wants to fit in. He felt out of this world to me. My mother had a strange feeling about him and years later I asked her about him and she told me that she couldn't do anything because he was so nice and polite, but to her he wasn't a child and seemed really weird. He just hung out with my friends and I for about a year. I have great memories with him and I feel like he taught us a lot. One day he just stopped coming to play in our neighborhood and no one ever saw him again. As time passes, things feel wrong to me. I have a deep feeling that I met someone too special. I'm not into supernatural stuff, but I can't help that there's just something mysterious about this boy. About 15 years back, a few friends and I broke into an abandoned pathology. It was pitch black in there, so we left on the first day. Nope. The next day around 10 p.m., we went back, geared up to the brim. Headlamps, flashlights, chalk, bolt cutter, and backup batteries. The entrance door was five meters tall and made out of thick, and I mean thick, like 10 inches thick, of wood. It was unbelievably heavy to open and made a real deep cracking sound. It was scary as hell, but whatever, we thought to ourselves. The building was a four-story building, Two basements, one ground floor and then the first. The main corridor was at least two meters in length with about eight doors on each side and at least five meters wide. This ceiling was about four meters high. Same thing on the other floor, except the basement, but we'll get to that shortly. The building was huge, big open rooms, but you felt watched in there. The floor in the ground, the first floor was made out of concrete and there was not much to see there, just empty rooms and graffiti. The basement were a different story. The ceilings, walls and floors were tiled, edge to edge. Everything had a white reflective surface. We were scared at this point, but kept on exploring. Remember the chalk we bought? We had it so that we could draw a line on the ground every two meters. That way we could quickly find the exit in case of spooky stuff happening. Good luck drawing chalk on tiles. So the first basement was built the same as the first and ground floor. Big rooms, long ass corridors and high ceilings, but tiled edge to edge. Not much to see there, just some candles and circles made out of roses that were dry. So they had obviously been there for a while. Bit spooky, but no matter, we kept on exploring. Now comes the second basement. This place was pure madness. It was like a maze, no structure at all as if the architect had a stroke while planning. No room was the same size. The ceiling was maybe two meters high and the corridors just wide enough to barely fit two people next to each other. Claustrophobic as hell. 
Some rooms were just squares with doors on each side. There was no reference points, and we had to remember the turns we made and reverse them. Two left, one right, second door left, and so on. Heart pounding and scared crapless. Clear thinking was critical, and every tiny noise there made us hold our breath. I've never felt so helpless before. We made our way through the maze and got pretty good at remembering the place. At one point, we all stopped and went silent. There was a huge door with somewhat of a padlock. Should we open it? One of my friends asked. Dunno. What if there are zombies in there? We all laughed, and I pulled out the bolt cutters. It took a few attempts, but we managed to crack the lock open. The room was filled with shelves, and the shelves were filled with files. And the files were probably filled with every person that was ever cut open there. The room was stuffed to the brim with autopsy reports. We packed our stuff and went home. That was enough for us. What gives me chills is that the whole building was empty, but they kept the files? I mean, the building is in use again, still a pathology, but why keep the files there? Even though this story isn't the scariest, I still like to share it from time to time. I really do wonder what they were doing with that still there. And the place in itself was seriously creepy. When I was in the fourth grade, I went to a pretty small charter school. I loved it so much. I loved every teacher I had. Our cafeteria was fairly small and we didn't have a real kitchen since the cafeteria doubled as the library. So we just got food shipped in from a caterer. Anyway, I knew almost all the cafeteria people because they were the other teachers and some of the office ladies. We had recess aides that cleaned up the tables and everything. One day there was a new guy there. He was tall. Maybe that's just because I was small. He had glasses, short hair and seemed pretty built. He was cleaning up tables and weirdly staring at the children. You know, that just horrific feeling you get when you know something is very bad and shouldn't be happening? I had that feeling. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I felt like I was going to throw up. As a child, I was very trusting and never felt this way before. It was only with this man. I ignored it and just kind of observed him with my friend Abigail at the time. For about two weeks, this kept happening. I'm going into the lunchroom, eat as fast as I could, and try not to make eye contact with the dude. Also, just some more detail. After we were done eating, we had to clean up our trash and then raise our hand so an aide could tell us if we could leave or not. So one day I'm done with my lunch. My friend and I raise our hands and I'm praying he's not the one to tell us to go because I hated looking at him as he always made me feel terrible and on edge. But lo and behold, he looks right in our direction. Usually aides are fairly lenient and would just nod their heads from across the room. But he walks slowly over to us, gets an inch away from the table, pulls out his rag and wipes it. You left a lot of crumbs. We just stared at him because what do we say? It was his job to clean up the crumbs. We pick up our trash, but he stares at us for what felt like forever and he says, you two are so adorable. You're like sisters with pretty blonde hair and big eyes, like dolls. I seriously thought I was gonna vomit. Then he continued, do you girls play with dolls? I'm sure you do. I bet you like dressing them up, huh? You might be thinking that that was harmless or what he said wasn't that bad, but he had never spoken to a kid before, at least that I had ever seen. He didn't even speak to the other aides. He finally told us we could go and waved after leaving. I told my mom the first time I saw him, but now I ran to my teacher's classroom and told her everything. That I always had a terrible feeling about him and what he said, and Abigail backed me up saying she felt the same way. The very next day I didn't see him and never saw him again after that. That sounds drastic, but I'm glad the school took it seriously because who knows if a kid would have gone missing or hurt by him. I'm only assuming that's what happened but I was relieved to never have to see him again. As a child, I used to play outdoors with my childhood best friend, Kyle. We would either knock on each other's doors and ask, can the other play outside? Or we would hear each other in our respective front yards and come out. 
One day when I was about ten, I started walking outside of my driveway because I thought I heard Kyle outside. I called out to him, and a little girl about my age came from around the, the back of the house. I learned her name was Amaya, and she told me she was going to be there all day because she was waiting for her mum to pick her up. I asked if Kyle was coming, and she said no. Kyle didn't technically live next door; his grandmother did, so it wasn't uncommon for him to not be on the block for days because he's at home. So we spent a whole day playing. I can't remember the exact time, but I knew it was from the hottest point in the day, from when the sun almost began to set. It was the peak of summer, so that meant we were outside for hours. We spent the first half of the day inside of my garage playing because it was cool. And as outside began to get cooler, we moved our shenanigans out into my driveway. After a few hours, she said that she had to go back because her mum was coming soon. I hugged her, really sad that my cool friend was leaving, but figured she must be related to my neighbour in some way, so I'd see her again. The next day, Carl's mum dropped him off at his grandma's, so I came outside to play. I asked him when Amaya was coming back, and Kyle said, "Who's Amaya?" I thought he must just be joking, but going back and forth, I realised he really didn't know who she was. I told him she had a blue top and blue khakis yesterday. Her hair was in three large twists with a pink bow bow. Kyle insisted he didn't know who I was talking about. I asked his brother, who was five years his senior, and he didn't know who I was referring to either. A little creeped out, I asked my parents, "Wasn't I playing with a girl yesterday?" My mum had no idea what I was talking about. They thought I was outside in the garage by myself. As a last resort, I asked Kyle's grandma. She told me there was no little girl there yesterday. She was home with her husband, and she didn't know a girl by that name. To this day, Kyle swears he doesn't know who I'm talking about. I don't know what to make of the situation. I know I played outside with this girl. We jumped rope, we blew bubbles, and played hand numbers. No one knew this girl called Amaya, but I spent all day with her. I study away from home, but go back for the holidays and other events. I went back home for New Year's after spending Christmas with my partner and his family. Outside the train station is a taxi area. And I got one to take me to my family home since it was late in the evening, and I had a large suitcase with me. The driver starts out by making small talk, asking if I had a long journey and where I travelled from, and what brings me here. I answered his questions to not sound rude, and said I was visiting family for the holidays because I study away. He starts asking more questions that I didn't realise were weird at the time. I'm autistic, so social cues aren't my strong point. Asking if I have any siblings, I have four. How old they are, and if they're all from the same parents. Looking back, it's weird, but as I said, he seemed to be just coming off as friendly. He asked if my parents were still together, which I felt was a bit too much, so pretended I didn't hear him. He then asks how old I am, if I have a boyfriend, and I told him I was twenty and I do, hoping that he would stop talking. We get to my street. And I ask him to drop me off at the end because I don't like being dropped off at my house by strangers, so they don't know exactly where I live. He tells me how much the fare was, six fifty, and I saw the meter. So I gave him a ten, and he gives me three fifty change. I get out and head down the street to my house. About ten days later, there's a knock at the door. My mum answers, thinking it's a parcel, and it's the driver. He asks if I'm in and asks for me by name. I had work that day and got the train and got the train in my uniform, so I had my badge on, which I forgot about. I know I didn't tell him my name because that's too much for me. My mum tells him I'm not in, and he starts looking past her in the house, presumably to see if I'm hiding. He then tells her that he just realised he didn't give me the right change, and he was here to give me the one pound he owes me. My mum assured him. That he can keep it and that it's fine, but he's very insistent and asks if he can come in to give it to me. My mum tells him again that I'm not here, but was upstairs, and he offers to wait until I'm back. My mum told him he couldn't come in because she doesn't know him and there are children in the house, including my one-year-old niece. 
After 10 minutes of saying he'll wait, and my mum asking for him to leave, he gives her this one pound before leaving and sitting in his car in the resident park on my street for another 10 minutes. He eventually leaves, which I guess means he was given a job, so thank God. I genuinely think he read my badge. I forgot I had it on, and then he watched me walk to my house so that he could come back later. Otherwise, he knocked on at least 10 other doors to find me, which is almost worse. The whole taxi ride, he kept telling me what a pretty girl I am, so that makes the whole situation, to me, even more unsettling. I'm now terrified of getting another taxi and worried that he'll come back, not for my sake, but because there are young kids in the house. Very creepy encounter, and it's taken me a good few days to just process how weird it truly is. I was alone at a cafe when I was approached by what I could best describe as a tweaker. I was mostly alone except for the staff. I, a painfully polite and friendly person in my early 20s, was kind of scared and cornered, so I was hoping he'd just leave me alone. I tried to escape through the front door, but he kept asking for my phone number, so I shook my head several times and asked to please stop bothering me. Next thing I know, an absolute unit of a man comes from behind the kitchen door of the cafe. He had long braided hair, sharp piercing eyes, was wearing an apron, a plaid shirt, with it rolled up showing his absolutely muscular forearms, and he comes up to me and says softly, Hey, are you here for the interview? While staring down the tweaker. I played along and nodded, yes, thinking, oh my god, this man's going to help me while he was taking me out of the back of the cafe. He said I looked like I was in a bit of trouble and that I could easily exit through the back. He led me out, beamed a big smile and told me to have a good day. I thanked him. I came back later a few days after and asked about the man working there. I asked for a manager and said that I wanted to thank the man for his quick intuition for saving my skin the other day. The manager looked really confused and said that no one with that description worked here. I would go to this cafe several times, but I never saw him again. I think he may have been an angel. I was in San Francisco helping out for an online event on one of the beaches a few years ago, and one of the side projects they had going on was clearing this wooded area that was an old bunker hill back before World War I and I believe was a machine gun post. Needless to say, the main bunker, you only had to slide through the small slit of the structure and it went down to a second level. That was the only way in. So a group of people and I entered and went down what could only be described as a dark hotel corridor with side rooms with a crumbling infrastructure. If this wasn't creepy enough, on the first wall in graffiti was written, Satan awaits. So we enter, go down to the basement type room, and all the rooms are pretty far gone from age and weathering. When we come upon the room labeled six, and this room's door frame was graffitied with a clown-esque design, and the only room with some type of graffiti beside the words upstairs, so it's pitch black, and we all have our camera flashlights to see, and this room has three voodoo dolls on the wall, with each of them having a six in the middle of the body with the words on the right saying, until the light takes us. This sent everyone into, hell, I don't want to be here anymore kind of vibes. So we finished up for the most part and make it down to the end of this winding corridor, where there's a large metal door with a small peephole, and the metal door wouldn't open due to rust. It's just freaking weird. When I was maybe seven or eight, I was playing in a big park slash wooded area in California, which is not where I grew up. We were visiting family, exploring, climbing trees, etc. My parents were within earshot, as was an aunt of mine, but they were talking and certainly not in my line of sight. I saw a fox, a brownish reddish gold. I had not grown up around there, and as I mentioned, I had never seen a fox before. So in the manner of a curious child who didn't get to run around as much as he'd like, 
and was hyperactive when he did, I knew hell about wild animals and I chased after it. It ran, but with no particular urgency, a good bit faster than me, but not getting out of sight. It headed down a big hill with a fair amount of brush and a number of crooked trees growing out at angles from the hillside. I alternated between running down, clambering down and sliding on my ass, depending on the steepness. At the bottom of the hill was a clearing, with a big tree in the middle, a trunk wider than I was tall. At the foot of the tree was a sort of lean-to structure, a pit dug into the ground with sticks and branches, and some cardboard leaned up against it, making a sort of tent-like enclosure, like something a homeless person would make to get out of the rain, or an enterprising kid would build as a clubhouse. The fox trotted into the structure, and I, who was still getting down to the last stretch of the hill, lost sight of it. Around the time I got to the bottom of the hill, a girl crawled out of the lean-to. She looked to be my age or a little younger, had messy hair. I would love to say that it was the colour of the fox's fur, but I can't remember for sure. She had leaves in it and blue denim overalls and didn't wear shoes. At that age, few things had crystallised into seeming impossible yet. I checked the lean-to, no fox, nor anywhere that I could have seen it could have gone. The girl was standing there looking at me, so I asked something to the effect of, were you the fox I was chasing? And she said, with the sort of proud aren't I cool tone, yes. Are you a person who can turn into a fox with magic? I asked. And she said, I'm a fox, but I can look like this too. Do you live here? Yes. What do you do for fun? I play games, I catch bugs, I hunt mice, I hunt birds. Sometimes I get cinnamon buns from the vending machines. Pretty sure her responses are all word for word of what she said, but it was a long time ago. And that was my curiosity satisfied. What can I say? I was a simple kid who read a lot of fantasy. I was like, okay, wanna see some cool rocks I found for looking for pill bugs? Or something for that effect. And we played together for an hour. I don't remember all of what we did, but I remember that I found several cool rocks in total, and she liked all of them, and would stare googly-eyed at each, and she could run way faster than me and jump way further, and was great at catching bugs, which she did by crouching, then leaping forward and whipping her cupped hands over them, letting them go after she'd showed me. She was endlessly fond of being complimented about her running and jumping and bug-catching prowess, and would sort of pose and strut around when I said something that she'd done was cool. And she thought it was really neat that I had a book with me, a paperback edition of the Dark is Rising series. I can't remember which or why I had it on me in the first place. I think I offered to let her keep it, but she told me she didn't know how to read. But I might have imagined that part sometime later. I do know I gave her all of the cool rocks and she put them into the lean-to, because they kept falling out of her overall pockets. Eventually, my folks, who, as it turned out, had been calling me for a while, were growing very worried to find out that I'd gotten out of earshot and started down the hill towards me, fire a more gradual roundabout path than the one I'd taken. Still, calling. I heard my mother was sounding worried and angry. So I said to the girl, well, I gotta go. I had a lot of fun, bye, and legged it over to my family. I got scolded pretty bad and lectured on the importance of staying close enough to hear. And by the time it was done, I didn't feel like I'd explained that I'd met a fox who could look like other kids and liked cinnamon buns and interesting rocks. I never saw the girl again. I'm not sure if I ever went back to the park or wood. If I did, it was on the trip. And I now have no idea where it was, apart from the general Berkeley or possibly Albany area. It only occurred to me years later that I had a strange day that day. At least, it was fun. In my school district, it has something called Kid Safari, basically just school-run daycare and summer camps. I was doing a safari at one middle school meant for about 800 people. The safari had maybe 50 kids, 70 at most, so the place was practically empty aside from certain classes and rooms. This place also had a basement so extra creepy. In our classroom, the boys got together and just told stories. 
It came down to Bloody Mary and stuff, and I was in second grade, so that was scary. Just after I heard a Bloody Mary story, and had to go to the bathroom, which was just down the hall, I asked my friend Nathan to go with me. He said no, but after a bit of convincing, he came with me to the bathroom. I walk in, and one of the lights next to the mirror is off. I just heard Bloody Mary, so I take priority and try to turn it on. It was a tap, and I started tapping the button, but there was nothing. I try again, nothing. So I start spamming the button, and finally it turns on. But I'm spamming it and don't have enough time to stop. When I hit it again and bam, I stomp my foot in frustration, and my friend, as a joke, tries to turn off the other light. It works. It's now really dark, besides the blurry window outside. I'm right next to the door handle, so I'm already on my way out. The moment I touch the handle, everything starts moving really slowly. I get a mega chill down my spine, and decided to turn around and see this huge, pitch black, shadowy figure, hunched up against the seven foot tall ceiling like an adult in a little playhouse. My friend Nathan is closest to it, and he sees it too. I run out my bathroom faster than Usain Bolt. Nathan follows a second later, and I refuse to go to the bathroom there for the rest of the summer. Nathan, however, ran experiments with all the guys to see if they could find it again. They found it every now and again, but one story from one of my other friends who didn't believe me said he was in there when they were doing it, and he didn't really believe them. And when they turned the light off, looked directly behind him, screamed. And they ran. He turned around and saw the thing staring at him. He had to finish peeing as it started walking towards him, and he ran out the bathroom, pulling up his pants and almost crying. He said that the thing tried to grab him, but that it missed him at the last second. This happened to my sister and brother-in-law. They have a hobby called urban exploration. Fancy word for trespassing abandoned buildings, but anyway. They were in this old abandoned nursing home in the middle of the night, just doing what they usually do, looking around, taking pictures of the interesting things that time forgot, and experiencing the adventure of breaking a minor law. At one point, one of them found an old, broken, life alertish alarm. Not the exact thing, but same concept. They had some magnetic slip or something, and it would go off if one of the old people fell. It was in terrible condition and didn't have any batteries in. But one of their stupid friends picked it up and held onto it for a while. A bit later, they were checking out another area of the home, and there was a heavy steel door closed with a metal hatch in front of the sanitarium section, like the intensive care section or something. And they decided not to go in and to turn around and keep walking, and then heard the loudest blast they've ever heard, and turned around to see the steel door had just. Bashed open the wrong way. The door was supposed to open inwards, but it had flown open outwards, ripping right through the metal door frame. Needless to say, they got out of there. After they calmed down inside for a while, they decided to go back. They've been doing this for a while, and they don't believe in ghosts. They know there has to be a rational explanation for it, and they're just about to go inside when they hear a loud ass beeping. They look at their friend, who's still holding the powerless, broken alarm, and it's going off like crazy. He throws it to the ground, and the beep starts sounding like screaming, and they get the hell out of there. I work in a paper mill purchase department. I was sent to Sweden to buy some specialized material from a mill in Greksbo. Me and two engineers arrive at the gate. But the guys are all very busy. We loiter for a bit, and after a while, they send their junior machinists to deal with us. Out comes a guy, who you would not say looked like a professional machinist, tall but skinny, with long hair, a scraggly beard, and an eye patch. He had this strange, life-worn face that could have been twenty-five or fifty-five. Add that to a hippie linen shirt and some torn jeans. If not for the hard hat and tool belt. He would have looked like a malnourished pirate turned hippie. He greeted us in accented, overly polite and formal English. He almost sounded like he was mocking us, using over-the-top, antiquated, polite language, and referred to us as kind sirs, etc. We thought the purchase 
will fall through because the Swedes clearly didn't care about us and sent a junkie to deal with us. But the guy turned out to be 100% professional, if not extremely strange. Finally, under Eye Patch Guy's supervision, the forklift operator loads up the pumps and hatches we were to buy and starts palletizing it, secures it with belts, etc. And we finish the formalities and head up to see it all loaded onto a truck. Then a scrub happens. One of the forklift guys screws up and hits a pallet with another. A heavy industrial pump slides off the pallet and almost falls off the ramp. The warehouse guy panics and pulls it to a line back to no avail. Our Swedish Cotton Eye Joe casually pushes past them, grabs the edge of the pump, which was like 350 kilos, and with an effortless tug pulls it back onto the pallet. The guy must have weighed as much as a wet mop, and yet he effortlessly pulled more weight than strongmen competitors. We stared in disbelief and the Swedes laugh. Apparently he does this kind of stuff all the time. We pack up and leave. A year later, we visited the area again, but the guy no longer worked there. Apparently one day he just quit and left. No one knows what happened to him. Despite being friends with him for a few years, the other Swedes knew nothing about him, about his family, history, where he lived, whatever. To make it stranger, the guy didn't even drive, so as far as they knew, he must have just quit the job and hiked all day to wherever he went. After a while, I read American Gods and it kind of clicked. If there are pagan gods among us, he was definitely one of them. A few years back, I was without a car and lived in what we consider the downtown area of Pensacola, Florida. Being that I didn't have a car, I frequently Ubered to and from work, and sometimes from bars downtown if it was late and felt unsafe as a small lesbian walking home. Our town doesn't have a lot of hate crime, but unwelcome confrontation from religious people and just general ignorant people. I never really had a problem with any of my drivers until I met James. James was, I assume, from somewhere else, because his English wasn't as good. Obviously, not a problem. He'd picked me up to take me to and work a few times, but I had a hard time understanding him, so our conversations were short and confusing. One of times, instead of talking, he sang to me the name game. I have a usual conversation, but it rhymes with Bailey, Haley, Kaylee, etc. That happened. It was okay, kind of funny, but it lasted the 20 minute ride home. So I got weird and didn't know what to say after a while. Fast forward to a few months later, I had drank a few beers at a local dive bar and it was time for me to walk home. I realized I was probably too drunk to walk because who the hell where my drunk mind would let me wander off to. So I called an Uber and it was James. He recognized me and I climbed into the car and we proceeded to my house. I was only maybe two miles from it. Not a bad walk during the day, but at night, nah. Or James decides that instead of going home, he wants to stop by and buy me a Whataburger because I need food before I get home, right? Sweet, right? So instead he drives me to Whataburger. At the point I'm so cool and happy with what's happening. Well, here comes Whataburger and he drives straight past it. I'm like, hey, that was it. And he says, yeah, I know, but I forgot my wallet at my house, so we're gonna go there first. That's when I start to sober up and tell him, no, just take me home. Well, he doesn't stop and first argues that I should be nicer as he's doing me a favor. So I get a little more vocal. And after he says, fine, I'll turn around and said something in another language that I can only assume was obviously a derogatory term. I felt like I couldn't wait, so I hopped out at a red light and just risked the walk home. That would have just been two miles, but is now about four because I'm down by the Whataburger. End of story. I did make it home safe, but sadly on my way home, the police stopped and searched me because I was out late and they considered this a bad neighborhood. They didn't even want to give me a ride home because it's such a bad neighborhood. They didn't care about the weird driver because nothing happened. It was quite creepy to me. I dinged his rating and I think it was only a month or two after I had bought a car. 
But after that encounter, I had a few friends who were more than willing to help me with work till I got my car right. I don't know if he sees Uber requests and when he saw mine declined it, because I had a lot of dropped Ubers and my rating is still five stars. My girlfriend had broken up with me. I was walking home crying. When out of nowhere, a younger looking girl, maybe three or four years younger than me, comes out of nowhere and says, uh, hi, it's dark and I'm alone. I see we're going in the same direction and you've been crying. Maybe we should make company. I said, sure, and asked her what her name was. She just replied with, uh, name. Maybe later we can get to know each other. First, let's just talk. We had the most wonderful conversation. She was super insightful and had an answer to my every question and a comment to my every word. To this day, it's been my favorite conversation ever. We walked for blocks and blocks. As soon as I said, hey, thanks, I was super sad, but I'm not anymore. I felt super lonely, and now I don't. The talk has been incredible. She said, okay, this is my house. I asked her for her name and she said, no, it's not necessary to know that. Thanks for keeping me safe. She kissed me on the cheek and entered the house. I had lived there for five years and lived there for an extra five after that and had to walk very often by that house. Never saw that girl again. Pretty sure she was some kind of angel. When I started working my last job, it was for people who had assisted living homes, beautifully built to accommodate the elderly. Days before starting work at a newly built house, the company owner had me take some things over there one evening. It was autumn and growing dark earlier with nighttime closing in pitch black, where there were no lighted areas. It was an area where new homes were being built near surrounding woods with very few streetlights. Upon entering the new house, I went to find the place and was told to put the stuff down. I walked around admiring the beautiful new rooms and furniture, although something seemed off. I knew that I was fortunate to be getting the full-time position on my preferred shift working in this beautiful new house. Although I was satisfied, something in the atmosphere seemed very off. It wasn't the expectant feeling of being a bit nervous working with different people with most of whom I'd never met, or the feeling of emptiness of a place or property having been never occupied. The entire area where the homes were being built just felt off. Business at the new house began as it slowly filled with residents and more than enough work for one or two of them alone. Strange vibes from the house still were going strong. It wasn't until several months later, the workers began to mention strange experiences they had. This didn't happen until some residents had passed away in the home, but I did not consider that as being the reason for the strange events. Not entirely anyway. The first weird thing that I heard was that a coworker was telling me that she felt as though she was being smothered as she sat near a resident's bedside working the midnight shift. I will always remember the time that I was taking a break and making popcorn in the microwave. Some had burned. Fearing it would smell up the house, I took it to the garage that was conveniently attached to it. When I came back inside the house, the entire kitchen reeked with the scent of air freshener. There were plug-in air fresheners in other rooms of the house, but none in the kitchen at the time. The strong scent I was smelling was nothing like the other air fresheners, and they were not even the type that have the automatic sprays. I checked all over the house for any air freshener spray cans or cleaners that may have been a cause for the scent, but found nothing. All cleaners were in the garage and the residents were all sitting quietly in the living room. Some incidents that were told to me were from two co-workers that experienced lights turning on and off without them touching them. One worker, said that she had turned out the main light in the living room because it was bothering a resident's eye. After helping all of the residents to bed that night, she came back up from the hall only to find it was turned back on. She thought someone was in the house. A worker on the midnight shift mentioned that she had the lights on in the main part of the house. 
She had gone into another area of the house, and when coming back out, she found the lights out and very dark. One evening after my shift, I was talking to one of my good co-workers over the phone as she was working at the house. She told me that she had heard something in the hall area near some of the bedrooms. To her surprise, she found one of the Christmas ornaments that hung on a doorknob moving all on its own. It was repeatedly lifting out and hitting the door in a quick, timely manner, creating continual knocking. The ornament was very light, made of felt in Christmas colors with small bells lined down the middle and front. There was also a small brown felt Christmas tree on the bottom of the front. All of the bedroom doors had one of these kind of ornaments hanging from the outer doorknobs to decorate for Christmas. What creeped me out was the methodical, rhythmic way it was knocking, as if something was saying hello. She took a video on it on her phone, and I asked her what she thought about it. She said she didn't know what to think. She wasn't one to believe in ghosts. I thought that maybe she was trying to play a funny prank on me. I tried to use a fan to blow the ornament and see if I could get it to move like it had been before. The fan just made it blow in all directions no matter what speed I set, or where the fan was placed. It seemed to me that if a string was used to make it move, the ornament could have been much heavier for a quick pull of gravity to make that precise knocking. Some months later, a new employee started working the midnight shift and was doing room checks. When approaching the door that once had the moving Christmas ornament, she heard the little elderly resident inside speaking with someone that sounded like another elderly lady. This was when all the other residents were soundly sleeping in their own rooms. Some nights later, I was told that the same resident came out of that room in hysterics one night, fearing that demons would harm her. I heard of this happening at least twice. This was entirely out of character for her. Demons were never something she'd speak of. Perhaps she was reacting to something in that room. Years later, the room became open for another occupant. Another little lady came to stay. When she was being assisted to her room for bedtime every night, she always stood in the doorway making the sign of the cross and would say, Bless the room. This I know to be true. I had seen her do it. No one had told her the story of it. It was as though she knew that something wasn't quite right with it. One afternoon, a worker came in for her shift, and the company owner also came in around the same time, needing some help, taking some stuff down to the basement. I stayed over my shift to help. We braced the basement door, which was designed to swing shut and automatically lock. My co-worker bumped a tall, thick drinking glass off the kitchen counter. It hit the hard, tile floor, sliding towards the open basement door and down the stairs it went. I could hear it hitting every step before landing at the bottom. It was a tall stairwell, and I dreaded cleaning broken glass. I went to retrieve it, not seeing any broken glass on the steps. When I picked up the glass, I could find no breaks, cracks, or chips upon examining it, though. When I had been expecting to find it damaged in at least some way. There was also a kind of chaplain that would come to the house and tell inspirational stories to the residents. He would sing and play music to them and have them sing along. They loved him. I briefly mentioned to him about paranormal things happening around the house, and I asked him if he could bless the house, and he said a nice prayer. One day when I was at work, a frequent visitor called me over to her and shockingly told me that something had just whispered her name in her ear. Another day, when she was visiting, she mentioned feeling an oppressive, threatening feeling as she went through her mother's clothes in the closet. She said that she was going to bring in some holy water and bless the house. She and I were in agreement on never talking about anything we discussed about the house. One day, not too long after, she brought in the holy water and we walked through the house in prayer. She marked each door in the sign of the cross with holy water and the paranormal activity seemed to die away after that for a bit. One night, a co-worker working the midnight shift was putting up Christmas decorations on the fireplace mantle. 
She took pictures with her phone camera of how it looked when she was done. A picture I had her send to my phone shows eerie bluish rays near the fireplace mantle by the ornaments and by the Christmas tree. She told me she had done a video in the room and it showed some really crazy stuff, but she deleted it. It was fun to kid co-workers and put out Christmas ornaments like that one moving on its own. So I don't know what it was with the Christmas decorations, but something seemed strangely attached to them. The house owner apparently bought many of them at different yard sales. I had also worked with two good co-workers each in different years who noticed the strange feeling from the house and surrounding area. We often wondered and talked about possible causes of it. The final creepy experience that I recall happened one afternoon when I stayed after my shift and was talking with a co-worker and a visitor in the kitchen. We were talking about some of the weird things about the house and she was sharing some of her own paranormal experiences that had happened in her own life. Right in the middle of conversation, three loud distinct knocks could be heard coming from a nearby bathroom that was in plain view. We all heard it. None of us recalled seeing anyone go in there and residents would have needed assistance walking anyway. We opened the bathroom door to find it dark and empty. Make of these experiences what you will, but I guarantee you that they are all true. I was someone working at a cash register in Walmart. As it was later in the night, I had a line full of people and one supervisor close by doing her thing. I looked up and saw this guy about two or three people behind my current customer and he gave me an instant feeling of unease. I saw this black fog type aura around him. I have never seen auras or any type prior to or after this but I kept a watch on him from the corner of my eye and could feel him just watching me. When I looked up again to take care of a customer, it was the weird guy instead. Even stranger was no one else was in my line anymore and I could no longer find my supervisor. It appeared that the store was quiet. All I remember about this guy was that he had long brown hair, average height and had the strangest blue eyes I'd ever seen. I looked up at him and asked him what I could do for him, and before the words even left my mouth, he stated he needed a specific brand of cigarettes, the whole time he had this knowing grin on his face. When I turned away to get him his cigarettes, everything went black. I couldn't see anything for what seemed like several minutes, but I'm sure it was only a few seconds at best. All I could think was, oh god, this man's in my head, and completely screwed my mind. And when I turned back to him, he just laughed, and this weird laugh like he knew what I was thinking. He looked at me and just walked away. As soon as he was gone, everything went back to normal. My supervisor returned, a line full of customers was there again, all of it. I felt off for several days after this encounter and had nightmares about the guy's eyes following me and telling me he was always watching me. It was Sunday night. I was at the airport about to request an Uber when I checked the lift prices, $20 cheaper. So I take lift. I requested one and almost canceled because it was taking a while to find someone when eventually a driver was found. Pretty much as soon as I entered the car and we started driving, he saw where I lived and started talking about murdering people, especially those on bikes in the city I live in. It wasn't just a one line either. He kept going on about it, how he'd get the cold sweats afterwards and decided he didn't want to feel that so he tried not to. During this, I'm messaging my boyfriend because the dude is making me feel super weird. I wasn't really trying to converse with him. So all of this was unsolicited information. Then he starts saying how he was going to do haunted houses and makes it seem super lame and like it was over. And then once you leave, when you thought you were safe, he'd get you. I ask him, how would you do that? Because I feel like a lot of people are really aware of their surroundings and I would definitely see you coming. He then said, you never know. I might just get you tonight. I laughed and said, I don't think so. As he's literally pulling up to my apartment. When we parked, he just kept talking and I was like, okay, bye. 
and I had to unlock the car door myself. And when I went to get the luggage from my trunk, he almost took off with it. It was weird too. Both when he picked me up and dropped me off, he'd just stand behind me like a weirdo. It was super uncomfortable. He definitely knows which apartment I lived in, and I'm pretty sure Lyft fired him. It's been a few weeks and I haven't seen him or his car hanging around my place even once, but I will continue to keep an eye out for him. I reported this to Lyft and the police department in the city and threats were made. I was in Seattle. I used to be a photographer and myself and my friend were wandering around taking pictures. We were at the Fishbowl Starbucks by Macy, sitting at the window and grabbing coffee, and Chris Cornell walked by. This was three months after he died, and the Chris that walked past us was circa 1990. We both jumped up and ran after him. I mean, that's how much he looked like Chris, and he was gone. Like, turned the corner of the building, got out of our sight in less than a few seconds gone. We thought, okay, maybe Cornell had a bye-blow in town. Oopsie babies do happen. He was famous, something could have happened, genes run strong, etc. But then in 2019, I was coming back from a show at the Nectar up in Fremont that I'd photoed, and I got off the bus at the wrong stop, up on the third near Pioneer Square. Rather than riding it to King slash Jackson like I'd meant to, it was one in the morning, and a bad idea for a female alone with a $4,000 camera around my neck to be in the neighborhood. After a while, I was quickly walking, but not too quick. The same guy wearing the same leather jacket and shorts and combat boots suddenly showed up at my elbow, gave me a nod, and I was this close to him now, and I swear it was a young Chris Cornell, and said something like, hey, you going to Chinatown? Which, yeah, I was, and I said so. And he said, I'll walk with you. I even get a bit nervous in this neighborhood. We walked all the way to King Street where I was staying and he never said another word, just smoked and walked. And I stopped at the door of the hostel and he continued on down the street, going under the gate to Chinatown and turned the corner. And I kind of feel weird sharing that because I'm a nobody and really think that sometimes ghosts just come and walk around with us for whatever reason. Some friends and I used to explore abandoned places for fun. We stopped because, hey, well, we could have died. Here are some of our more notable experiences. We explored an abandoned warship once. There was this old shore liner that was used in World War II that was later used as a vacation boat or something. Some old idiot bought it and shored it up in shallow waters and it was basically left to rot. We had to trek through hillbilly country and trespassers will be shot signs everywhere. We were definitely trespassing. One time, I went. I thought I could walk right up to it and climb in. The next, the river was really high and we had to wade out to it. That messed with me because we were definitely risking being bitten by snakes or stepping on rust, and the ship itself was rather boring. On another occasion, there was a giant old radio tower slash office building. There's a building in my city, all brick, probably 10 stories high in the ghetto, and it was used over the years for all kinds of stuff, but it was originally and mainly a building for radio. This thing was gigantic, kind of heavily secured, but we found an open window about a story up and shimmied in off a pipe. Once we got there, it was definitely a feeling of something being off. It was dark, of course, but it was also unsettling. It smelled wet. The story we found ourselves on was what used to be a chapel of sorts. There were a few pews in an old confessional Church stuff is scary as hell to find in a dark place with a cell phone flashlight. And we continued to look around and we climbed some stairs into the next story and were relieved when there was more light. But something was really wrong. It was very clean for an abandoned complex, like no rubble on the floor, no garbage, weird. And then we kept looking around when all of a sudden an alarm sounded extremely loud right when one of us saw a bobcat, the machine, not the animal, and the alarm went off. Easily the scariest moment of my life, and we took off with a singular pack mentality running for the stairs, but they were bricked in. Afterwards, we all agreed in our collective panic 
that we had the thought that hobos had walled us in quickly and quietly, as hobos do. We were wrong. We just went down the wrong stairs and ended up leaping from the window we came through and getting away with a few bruises. Damn, what a rush. The next story was from a place that was most certainly haunted. Or, you know, ghosts aren't real, but there was definitely a body crammed somewhere within this place. Allow me to elaborate. So, in a different terrible part of town, there was this abandoned apartment complex that used to be a school. Brick with wrought iron interior gates, wrought iron on the windows, etc. This place used to be a pretty secure building. Did I mention it was huge? Anyway, we shimmy into another window. A woman screams that she was going to call the cops from her double wide right beside this place. So that set the scene to be a little nervous. We get in and instantly I'm like, what is this feeling? Dust was everywhere, odds and ends from everyday life. It was like we entered into someone's old apartment. We carry on. The atmosphere wasn't comforting, but I ignored it. Like I said before, the hallways slash stairwells have these massive wrought iron gates and tile floors. Nice plaster molding, hardwood pillars. I doubt it was very hoity-toity. But I'm also surprised these nice older world details survived from the crackhead looters in the area. The hallways were very vast and we all find gunshot holes here and there. Same people would be like, screw that. But when you're exploring, you're like, yay, danger. So we explore a few apartments and I go off on my own for a bit into a closed apartment because I have absolutely no brain cells. And the first thing I notice are photos, Polaroids, all over the floor. And then it hit me that this place seemed to have been pretty hastily evacuated. And I don't know how to rationally describe it, but I feel like if I held up a ghost sensor thing to these photos, it would have exploded. We left not long after, fearing trailer lady would make good on her promise to call the police, and I'm glad we did. A friend of mine suddenly started a relationship with a girl a few years ago, and I can honestly say she's the only person I've ever met that's made me feel uneasy just by her presence. As I say, her arrivals into our lives were sudden to say the least. The friend went to get coffee one morning and said he would be back in a few hours. A few hours passed and the door opened and a girl who I'd never seen walked in, didn't acknowledge or seem to notice me, sat down on the sofa and remained silent. A few minutes later, my friend walked in and didn't really acknowledge that a stranger was sat in the room, nor introduced her as a friend and we just sort of got on with our day as normal but with this silent girl in the room. To fast forward the story, she didn't leave from that point on for the next few months. At the time, I was staying there sporadically, so I ended up spending a lot of time around her, and although she did end up speaking, it was quite rare and often stunted or vague. She would also suddenly burst out laughing at seemingly nothing, and then go back into silence just as quickly. Other strange things about her was that she only ate certain things, that she would almost always wear a coat, even if she had been indoors for hours. In the living room of his house, he had an open fire, and she would spend hours sat a few feet from it in her coat, staring into it without saying a word. However, the most unnerving thing about her was when she looked directly at you, her eyes were black, and she could stop a flowing conversation in its tracks with a glance. You could also sense when she was staring at you, even if it was from a distance. It was indescribable. Then, as quickly as she appeared, she just left again. The friend who was in a relationship with her rarely ever mentions her, and if anyone else ever did, he would just quickly move on from the conversation or simply not answer. This is still a few years later. Another friend who was a delivery driver saw her on one of his rounds. None of us had ever really spoken about her, but he confessed that he had sensed her being there before he saw her, and how weird that sounded. He was clearly weirded out by the situation, but in a strange way. It was reassuring to know that I wasn't the only one who had that experience. When my class was between the ages of 13 and 14 in June 2018, we were offered the chance to go on an English grade field trip to Washington, D.C with a handful of other schools. It cost around $1,000 per student, but we were all hyped to get the chance to go. 
I had two very close friends, Haley and Kay. Kay was relatively new to our school and had only gone here for a few years at most, but we were all pretty close already. So we all hurried to sign up together for a room and got accepted. So the day of the trip finally comes around and it's a 16 hour bus ride. I sit next to Haley in the back and Kay is on a different bus. When we finally get to the hotel we'll be staying at, it's around midday. The next day, we're all sore. Haley and I get off the bus, grab our key card and look for Kay. Kay has her nose to her phone and is texting someone, ignoring the rest of the world. I'm pretty loud so I shout her name and she finally looks up and smiles at us, wagging her phone in the air. We all get into the elevators together and go up to our room. And we start to get settled in as Kay explains who she was texting. Apparently there was a really cute guy on the trip who I used to be friends with before I moved into this school, she said, and he wants to meet up again and he invited me to his room. Now, Haley and I looked at each other because as much as we love Kay, she had a knack for messing around with lots of different boys, but she kept begging and pleading as we were still excited to be so far from home acting like adults and we agreed to go to his room. So the three of us head up a floor towards his room and start walking the long hallway to reach his door. As the three of us stand in front of it, we're all whispering to each other like, knock, no you knock. Finally, I knock and it opens first knock, first red flag. The guy that Kay was so desperate to meet opens his door shirtless and steps back and motions for us to follow him in. Glaring at Haley and I, but I could be mistaken. Haley looks at Kay and shakes her head, walking away. I go to follow Haley, telling Kay, good luck, but she grabs my arm and begs me not to leave her. I was a pretty shy kid and not used to shirtless, attractive boys, but I sigh and tell her I'll stay. She pokes me and tells me to go in, and we go back and forth again until I finally walk in. I sit down on the floor in front of the shirtless guy's bed and look up to what they're watching on TV, which was SpongeBob. There's another guy in the room on the other bed. He's not important though. Kay nervously walks in behind me and sits next to me on the floor, and it's about five awkward minutes of no one talking as we watch SpongeBob. Suddenly, the shirtless guy on the bed reaches down and grabs Kay, pulling her up to the bed towards him and tickling her. She screams and tries to play it off as laughter, but I rock it off the floor and turn to leave. I'm almost out of her reach when she grabs my arm very lightly and digs her nails in. I'll never forget the look in her eyes. She just said, don't leave me. But like the coward I am, I yanked her arm out and apologized. The creepy dude had his face by her neck and his hands are on her upper sides as he smiles up at me and I hear him tell Kay, let her leave. I run out the room and go down the hall trying to call Haley and get her to come up so we can go in together and get Kay out. I'm shaking as I go down the elevator to the ground floor to check her at the Starbucks, then go upstairs and check our room. I'm on the verge of tears as I leave our room and go check the ground floor again when I see her come out the stairwell with a cup of some Starbucks drink in her hand and she starts to call me. I shout out her name and she looks up at me and sees me. I must have looked a bit crazy because she rushes over and asks what's wrong. I explain everything to her as we head towards the elevator to grab Kay. When I finish, she angrily asks me why I left her alone with that guy and tell her I needed help. I was too afraid to say anything and we run down the hall to the creep's room and Haley bangs on the door. We pass the two other boys that we ran down in the hallway and the boys stop beside us and ask why we're knocking on their door. We explain that we left our friend inside and we were there to get her back. When those guys light up and say, there's a girl in there, like a couple of idiots. And then the creepy boy opens the door up with a shirt on and the boys run past him to look around their room. The creep looks at them. We stare at him as the other kids stare at us. And then they go, there's no girl in here. Haley and I book it back to the elevator and try calling Kay going back to our room. When we open the door to our room, Kay is sitting on the bed looking at the floor with her hands folded on her lap. Haley and I hug her and ask if she's all right and she nods and tells us she left shortly after. 
I apologized repeatedly and she said that it was okay, that she probably would have done the same thing, but I still felt awful because I'm much bigger and could have done something to stop it. For the rest of that trip, we called the kid Tickle Me Elmo because of what he did to Kay. And after the trip, I told my dad what happened and he agreed with me that we shouldn't have left her alone. If you girls had been any older, something very bad would have happened. When you go to college, don't ever leave a girl alone with a guy. I wish back I had the courage to say something, but I was an ugly zip faced kid with self image issues. Just know that if I ever run into the guy again, I won't back down. And this time I'll say what I want to do. A friend of mine took me to church so I could go to confession. There was a guy there, 20s or so, black slacks, white shirt, black tie. The odd part that he was wearing dog tags, military style, red metal, one with a raised cross and one with a cross cut out. After you finished in there, I need to speak to you, he said to me quietly. Uh, do I know you? No, but I know you, he said smiling, and walked off into the priest's office. Okay. So I asked the priest after confession who the guy was. He didn't know who I was talking about. No one had come into the office and he'd been there the whole time. My friend was convinced the guy was some sort of evangelical Protestant who wanted to convert the Catholics and said that we should get out of there. He got really nervous when I mentioned the priest hadn't seen him when we watched the guy go into his office and really rushed us out. As we were leaving, I saw the guy praying prostrate in front of a statue of Mary which scotched the annoying evangelical hypothesis. It seemed to make my friend even more jittery, so we left. About two weeks ago, I had my friend take me to confession again. Same guys there, dressed the same, says the same thing to me about needing to talk to me afterwards. While I was waiting in line at the confessional, my friend, who isn't Catholic, was sitting in the back pew, and I see the guy come in, beckon to my friend, who followed him out the chapel. When I came out of the confessional, my friend nearly flew down the aisle, grabbed my arm and started dragging me out, visibly terrified. Hey, I have to talk to that. The guy's not human. We're going now. Obviously, I'm going. What the hell? But I can tell he's not going to change his mind. The guy was waiting at the door, just normal, smiling and shook our hands. I said something about I was sorry and I couldn't talk. And he calmly replied that it was fine and we'd talk later. My friend nearly tossed me in the car and peeled out of their sweating. When he asked to come out, he said there were some people who showed up who needed help. After I did it, I asked why he couldn't help them himself. He said I needed to work on my anxiety, and he then started talking about my mental illness in detail, my meds, my therapy, my hospitalizations, all correct. I asked him carefully if there was a chance he'd seen the guy at his therapist's office or something, but no. Could he have worked at the psych hospital? No. Could he have been a fellow patient? Not at all. He'd never even seen the guy before. And the guy knew all about his mental issues. He said he was afraid of the guy, of what he might say to me because of my own mental issues. I was that freaked. I think he was an angel. We never saw him again. And I was always half pissed at my friend from pulling me away from a conversation with a possible angel. This super happy fun experience took place five years ago after a whole other incident with a neighbor stalking me. But this isn't about that. I had just started working a new job after Christmas. The company I worked for took over an account of a building closer to my home. So I transferred to the newly acquired location. After my first week there, some of the people began to ask me about my relationship status and began to take an interest in me. This little ray of sunshine happened to be single back then, but I was not ready to mingle. I was focused on work, my family, and school. I was only there for about three months and didn't end up liking the new location, so I left for a better suited job. Imagine my shock when some of the workers wished me an early happy birthday and luck at my new job. In a completely clownish move, the manager had disclosed where I would be working which I thought was a bit crappy. As I'm leaving, I'd seen something that I'd never noticed before. A phone list of employees with first and last names printed in the break room. Of the many what the actual hell moments to come, 
That was the first. I let the manager know he needed to remove me from it, as I no longer worked there, and two, would not be okay with it, even if I were to continue as an employee. He shrugged it off with the attitude of someone who assumes an upset woman is having her time in the month, rolled his eyes, and begrudgingly removed the piece of paper. I was thrilled to start my new job when the course started. Looking back, there had been maybe three months prior to what I believed was the beginning of this, but they weren't as persistent, so I didn't link them together. I just want to say that I have a tendency to bleach every red flag white. Please trust your instincts and scary movie. Run away when red flags are presented. So, I began to receive phone calls from a blocked number every week, only Fridays to Sundays, up with holidays, and always between 1 to 4 a.m. I have a weird thing about having my phone near me, and often at night, ever since my sister's accident. When she had said accident, and they tried to call me about her, my phone was often in the other room. For everyone who wants to ask why I didn't just shut it off or put it away, this is why. I'm an insomniac and a night sleeper, so the calls always woke me up. I tried answering them without saying more than hello, but always just heard breathing. This had gone on for three weeks when my birthday came. I worked my new job. Then, the rebel that I am, went and got a red box to take and have pizza and movie night with my parents to celebrate. So I'm scrolling through the ridiculously dull selection of red box tiles on my phone ring when one of the girls from my new job tells me that a guy who identified himself as my boyfriend had come and dropped off pizza, flowers, and a card for my birthday. Confused, I said I didn't have a boyfriend, and she nervously laughs and said that she found it very strange my boyfriend wouldn't know it was my day off work, and that he would need to leave the stuff there rather than give it to me in person. I thanked her, got my movie, and didn't give it too much thought. It was my birthday, so that was a problem for me tomorrow. The next day I opened the card at work, and it's tickets, photocopied. Not the actual ones I could have used to a place four hours away. In the card there was a lengthy poem and details on the trip, complete with dates, hotel name, and the person planned to take us on. Creep factor raised. I had no idea who this was from, and when I asked the co-worker, they could only give me a generic description. The weekend comes, and like clockwork, the calls come in. I decide not to answer and just decline the call. Life goes on. My mystery night and potential restraining order never came back to my work, and the calls continue. These calls went on for three years. I'll save you the unnecessary details, but I've changed jobs and moved in those years. The calls did not stop until the winter of last year. I tried answering and asking who it was. I tried screaming and cussing them out. I'd even tried having my friend answer. I tried having males answer and threaten. Basically, I tried more than Sam I Am tried to get you to eat green eggs and ham. A few times they would have a song queued up to play when I answered. The more it went on, the more emboldened they got. Then they started heavy breathing and then whispering my name. At one point they ended up graphically describing what they dreamed of doing to me. I called the cops who said without an actual threat they couldn't do anything. Dreams don't count as threats is what I was told. I called the phone company to see if they could tell me the number of the caller, who told me they couldn't disclose that and to call the cops. I ended the phone call with a cheery, when you see someone wearing my skin as a suit on the news, remember this, have a great day. I am now debating on changing my phone number. There are personal legit reasons why I didn't do this before, but also seriously concerned with who the hell this is. For someone to be committed to calling you every weekend for the rest of that long is extremely frightening. One morning after another two unknown missed calls, I wake up from a text from an unknown number, and I'm greeted with an unsolicited dick pic. Fun fact, no one wants an unsolicited dick pic. I responded stating if whoever it was ever contacted me again, their photo and phone number would be placed on Craigslist men seeking so that they could get their own share of dick pics. I reverse searched the number, and lo and behold, I got a name of someone who I briefly worked with at the beginning of this story, and then it all started to click that the call started once I began that job. This guy would have known where my new job was and about my birthday since the co-workers I had working there wished me an early happy birthday on my last day. Sending him that pic 
solidified that he was the caller. That's all, folks. Anticlimactic ending never saw or heard from him again, thankfully. So, to the weird obsessive guy, I guess we probably won't meet ever again. This is one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me. I live in Canada and attend a college in a city that's not very safe. But since I was a first year student, I was so new to the city and thought nothing would ever happen to me. Ignorant teenage moment. I'm stranded in the middle of the night. It was about 3 a.m. I had stayed late at college to finish an assignment, which I ended up finishing nearly at midnight and waited two hours before giving up, especially since there were weird middle-aged men pulling off weird vibes waiting for the bus. They kept glancing at me and I got annoyed, so I finally crossed the street where there was a run-down Tim Hortons. I called my older brother who was working shift at the airport, and luckily he was on break, but it would take him about an hour to come get me since the airport was in a different city. So I sat outside on a table with benches and waited for him, unaware that I was being watched by some dude the entire time. I guess it wasn't hard for him to notice me in the dark, since I was wearing a pastel pink sweater, but he came up from me out of nowhere, which really startled me. He greeted me abruptly, and being the typical Canadian, greeted him back and asked him how he was doing. He took a seat across from me on the table and said he was doing great, and also proceeded to tell me that he noticed me sitting outside for quite a while, which immediately set red flags off for me. Nevertheless, I stayed rooted to my spot, as he started asking me why I was out here, where I went to school, what program I was studying and in which city I lived, which I all answered, of course. It was stupid of me, but I didn't know what else to do, as I didn't want to be mean or rude. He then asked my age. I told him I was 17. Immediately, there was this uncertain look on his face, but he just kept on going with whatever the hell he was saying. I just smiled and nodded at him, but my smile dropped once he asked me if I wanted a ride in his car. I then told him my brother was coming to pick me up, and he asked how long he would be. I said he'd almost be here, so there'd be no need for him to give me a ride. But this dude kept asking me if I was sure, and that he could take me home. Bear in mind it was past 3 a.m. at this point, and if he really thought I was going to say yes to getting in his car, then he was delusional, which I think he may have been. He might have been a killer, or a rapist, or a paedophile for all I knew, because I looked a bit young for my age, and have a girly girl kind of vibe, so maybe he approached me thinking I was younger than 17, based on the fact he wasn't really bothered if I was a minor. Anyway, thanks to my constant nose, he finally got up, gave me goodnight with a weird smile, got into his black truck type car and slowly drove off. I was a bit shaken by the whole thing, but luckily about 10 minutes later, my brother pulled up to where I was and I never mentioned what happened before he arrived. I was at a college dive bar on a Friday night. This place would get crowded, and I was an avid pool player. People knew me at parties and stuff because I'd always go out to play pool almost every weekend. I'd get money, free drinks, free beers for winning. I'd run the table. Sometimes I'd grab a random partner to do twos, me and my random person versus two other drunk frat kids or something of the sort. Anyway, this one spring night, the bar is packed with a bunch of younger 21 to 24 year old kids, including myself at this college dive bar. I'm trying to find a partner to play with. In walks a well-dressed man in a tuxedo, which is sort of out of the norm for this place, with very well-groomed white hair, dress shoes, and appears to be in his late 70s. I felt like I was playing pool that night with God. The guy did not miss a shot, and he was on my team. We played people at the bar until close, and kids were dropping money on the table trying to bet against us, thinking we'd lose at some point. But nope. Tuxedo Man and I won every game. I've never seen him since at that spot. 
was the one and only time. It's the one year anniversary of this happening, so I thought I might share it. Last year I was traveling home from South Africa. My depression and anxiety was at one of its worst points when I finally arrived in Heathrow from Durban. I was exhausted from the 11 hour flight I had been on since 1 a.m. Due to the way my connecting flight from Heathrow to Glasgow worked, I had to pick up my bags and redrop them off. So after that, I had about a five hour wait for my next flight. I went through security a little flustered as this was my first time traveling completely alone. I was with others on my flight out though. And after I got through security, I went to the airport showers. There was this older man standing outside the showers. I thought this was a little odd because if you've been in Terminal 5, you know the showers are a little bit further away from the rest of the duty free and restaurant area. I just assumed he was waiting for someone until he stared and smiled at me, entering into the women's section. Something about the smile made me move faster. He wasn't there when I came out the bathroom. Thinking no more of it, I went to get some food for quickness and went into the Starbucks, which was near enough slap bang in the center of the terminal. The queue was so long I decided to call my mum. We chatted for ages when I realized someone was standing way too close to me. If it weren't for my rack sack, I'm sure the person would have been right against my back. I probably don't need to tell you who it was. And without making it look obvious, I took a step back, which pushed him away. Acting innocent, I turned and apologized. That's when he smiled at me. This time I smelt his breath, which was beyond foul and he radiated B.O. In what I think was French, he said something to me, which I think was, ça va ma chérie? Which if I'm right, translates to, it is fine, my dear. Bit weird, but as I previously mentioned, I'm not all that bright. The queue moved forward and I ordered and paid and waited for my sandwich and drink. When my name was called, I stepped forward and just went to take my things when he took them off me and said in English, a sweet dear like you shouldn't have to carry things. I quickly grabbed them and walked away and went and sat on the benches. He sat across from me and put his hand on my knee. I got up and moved. Next, an arm went round my shoulders. I got up again, but this time finding one ounce of vague intelligence, I went to the British Airways help desk who brought me the police who tried to get me to spot him, but by this time he had vanished. They told me not to worry and to sit near the help desk where I phoned my brother who calmed me down. Later, the police escorted me onto the plane where I finally made it home, where a hug from my parents has never been so appreciated. This happened to my dad 40 years ago. Both parents were in their early 20s and my two-year-old sister had been diagnosed with very rare aggressive cancer. She was not expected to survive. The chemo treatments and medical bills that were piling were understandably causing enormous stress on my parents. One early evening, my dad noticed a car parked outside of the house. We didn't live in a safe neighborhood at the time, so my dad went to check it out. An older woman was sitting inside. She told my dad that her car broke down. He offered to help her and was getting ready to go inside to grab jumper cable leads and tools when she stopped him. She looked at him and said, everything is gonna be okay. He didn't think much of it, but got the tools. And when he came back outside a few minutes later, she was gone. My sister beat the cancer and my dad never saw the lady or her car again. <laughs> 